Welcome to a Northampton Board of Health meeting. Um, before we open the proceedings for the formal board meeting, um, we'll have a public comment session. This is the time for the public to speak. Um, as um, during the formal board meeting, we don't generally invite the public to speak. So if you have something you'd like to say, um, we'd like you to raise your uh, virtual hand or wave at us. Um, Gary, I see your hand, Karen, um, and uh, if you could state your name and um, Suzanne, would you do the honors? I think we'll limit comments to two minutes. I can um, do that. And we'll try not to cut you off, but please try to be succinct. And we are really um, interested in your comments. Um, let me just write down who we have. We have Gary, Karen. Amanda, Maureen, um, Rachel. We'll start there, then we'll ask it again. Um, okay, it is 5.31. Um, welcome, and um, if you would, um, Gary, you can, um, let's see. You can unmute yourself and um, and identify yourself and go ahead. Okay, I'm Gary Drimmer. I live in Village Hill, and I I'd like to say thank you to the Board of Health, uh, the mayor. I saw he was present as well as the other. Um, members of the community. Um, I am here to request that the Senior Center require vaccinations. But before going into this, re the reasons why I feel that we need to protect our most vulnerable citizens in a public building dedicated to them, I would like to mention one other issue, masks. The August, 8th, the August 10th mandate seems to have been forgotten, just as COVID numbers in the region are going up. I was in contact with the health department today to report three cases of businesses or institutions ignoring the mass mandate. Um, Amy Hutchison said they would be sending out an inspector at their earliest con um, convenience. Um, the officials, the, the offenders were Burke, Chevrolet, Firestone, and the pool room at the senior center. Um, that was my segue into a COVID vaccine requirement for entry at the senior center. With 23% of Hampshire County being over 60, but that represent 94% of the deaths in the county, according to healthequity.org, there is no question that seniors are the most vulnerable people in our community um, and we need to protect them. I recognize this is no cakewalk for the senior center, but it can and should be done. Would anybody want to be responsible for the killing of a grandmother, either from COVID or from being isolated because they do not feel they can go to the senior center without being exposed? I know of people, several who are here tonight, several who will not speak, but who are here tonight, who do not go to the senior center now because they do not feel safe. This includes my wife who is here, um, who has a weak immune system. It includes a volunteer who I met who says he cannot go to the senior center and help other people in, with their computer needs because he feels exposed and he would not want to expose them either. We need to work as a community. We need to require proof of vaccination for entry to the senior center. We need to protect the most vulnerable people in our community, the seniors. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Um, just before we go to the next speaker, Meredith is our um, interpreter um, on transcript. Do you know how to turn that on? Live transcript is on, Joanne. Is on, okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Karen. Oh, do I have to, I don't have to invite you to unmute, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you for doing that. And uh, I'm Karen Foster, I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor. I live in Northampton. Um, and I don't 
think I could properly express my gratitude to the Board of Health and to Meredith Hillary for what you all have taken on um, during these past nearly two years. Um, it's, it's really incredible and impressive. Um, I won't take much of your time because I did speak during the last meeting as well, um, but I did just wanna follow up and once again, um, elevate the voices of my constituents who are asking for a vaccine mandate at the senior center. And I've thought about this um, quite a bit, sort of, you know, what, what that means. And I don't think anybody expects that's a silver bullet, that it's their paths to safety. Um, but at the same time, I think it represents a step toward inclusion and toward awareness of some of the most vulnerable members of our community. And I understand that people have virtual programming options. I think the Senior Center has done a, a really incredible job of offering that. And in some ways, it's almost like choosing who are we going to ask to take advantage of those virtual options? Is it um, going to be people who are really vulnerable, who maybe are going to feel just a little bit more comfortable going to the senior center if there's a vaccine mandate, or might it be the people who don't want a vaccine mandate? It's almost like a like a pick one. Um, and you know, I don't think we're asking for a citywide mandate. We're not asking um, for huge things, but for one place in the city, for people who are immunocompromised um, and who are older and who are more vulnerable to feel like there's just that next layer of protection. Um, you know, I, I appreciate seeing that it's on the agenda. I appreciate you taking it up and, and I would uh, really encourage robust discussion and, and, and a close look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Amanda, Linda, you're on, the, you're on my list. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, the two of us are gonna speak, so. Um, <clears throat> I'm a citizen of East Hampton. Um, with all of this COVID um, issue that's been going on, I've reached out to many different cities and the city who has shut me out the most has been Northampton. Nobody will have a conversation with me that will answer any of my questions. I'm not trying to come at anybody, but how come the city that when I was in a teenager in the 90s, the city that stood for like civic engagement and progression and, and the city to me that was a beacon of hope for like, conversation and dialogue about different issues. How come this is the city that won't talk to me? I'm, I'm just like, it's, it's just, I'm floored. I've, um, I, I don't know why that's going on. It makes me almost want to cry, but I'm here to talk about the masks. Um, I, we have citizens policing one another, um, people ratting each other out. What, like, what is going on? This is, this is super divisive. And many other cities have lifted this mandate and Northampton just simply won't do it. And the climbing gym, I'm a rock climber. The climbing gym is in Hadley. I can't go to the climbing gym. I can't breathe with a mask on when I'm exercising. I pass out on a rope. So I can't do what I love to do. I had to travel an hour because climbing gyms are not very, like, you don't, there's not a lot of, I had to travel an hour to Connecticut to climb. And, and it's what I want to do. I want to be in shape so I can go ice climbing, which is one of my dreams. And I'm not even able to, like, stay in shape around here because there's a mandate that doesn't allow me to breathe. This is crazy. Um, so I'm just asking for people to understand that this is, this is impacting people's lives to have this mandate in place. And um, that's all I have to say about that. And Justin would also like to speak. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, actually for um, the senior center um, having the protections. I'm, I'm happy that um, you know, the more vulnerable people are, are being protected. Um, I think that that's what's going on right now, that they're protected and that um, in the end, there's other cities that have gotten rid of the mask mandate. And um, I think that the two things can coexist. Um, I think the senior center can be protected. And I think that people can, you know, effectively go about doing their business without um, the necessity of masks. Um, so I just humbly request the uh, Board of Health to you know, review what the other cities are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Maureen? Where is Maureen? Maureen, wave at me. Yeah. Um, oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> I'm a Northampton resident uh, with a background in public health. I've generally been very, very pleased with the way that Northampton has handled uh, this COVID pandemic, both in terms of masks and uh, providing vaccinations and testing. I want to support what Gary said earlier about the importance of the senior center being a safe place for people, uh, for vulnerable people in our community. And um, I hope that, that, I'm glad that that's on the agenda for tonight and I hope it will be seriously considered. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Hi, everybody. So uh, I'm also in favor of the, the vaccine mandate for the senior center. As a person who uses the senior center, I uh, am as vaccinated as you can get, but older people are vulnerable. Uh, there are breakthrough infections. Um, I'm on the treadmill huffing and puffing with my mask on. I don't wanna wear my mask, but I know I have to wear my mask. But the point is that we're all exercising really hard in there and we need to be safe. I think we're starting to get used to showing our card. Um, if we go to a concert, if we go to a movie, I mean, it, it is a, a bit of a pain, uh, but on the other hand, we need to think about other people and not just ourselves. So I really strongly feel that if there is a place in Northampton that needs a vaccine mandate, it is the senior center. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Linda, where is Linda? There I am. Okay. Thank you so much for holding this meeting and having it be open. Um, I want to give a big shout out to the Board of Health for the way the vaccines were handled. I was so impressed and still am with, with the work you do. And a big shout out to Gary Drimmer because he has kept us informed about vaccinations, mandates, and getting testing. He's just a wonderful resource for our community. Perhaps you should consider hiring him if he, if he wants a job. But I'm, I'm, I'm echoing everything that Gary said. I have not set foot in the senior center and I will not until there is a vaccine mandate. I don't see that it's a very complicated thing. I have my little pass. I show it to the people that need to see it. We are the most vulnerable part of this population. Please protect us. Please have a vaccine mandate for the senior center so that once again, I can go watch a wonderful movie there. I'm not sure I'm ready to eat there, but I would love to go and connect with people. It's a wonderful resource that we could be using if we were more protected. And I would encourage all the people on the Board of Health to really think seriously. I don't think this is a very complicated thing to do, to ask people to show their pass. So with that, I thank you and Let's hope for hope you'll make a good decision here. Thank you. Um, I see Eleanor and then Kevin. Go ahead, Eleanor. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm here to say uh, to speak against uh, a vaccine mandate. I have at the senior center. I have. Uh, dear friends who are chemically sensitive, who can't get the vaccine um, uh, for health reasons, and uh, they are being careful and staying healthy, but there are fewer and fewer places that they, they can go because of the uh, increasing mandates. Um, they might want to uh, go to the farmer's market at the senior center to buy food, or they might want to vote, and I feel it would be shameful uh, not to allow them. Um, I've talked to uh, someone at the senior center uh, who told me about the, uh, they require everyone to wear masks, they require distancing. And it's not clear that banning people from the senior center would actually make anyone uh, safer. So um, I'm glad that the city of Northampton doesn't discriminate. Um, and I hope there will be no vaccine mandate at the senior center. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, uh, my name is Kevin Mackey. I'm a resident of Florence and um, I've been hearing a lot of these testimonies today. Uh, I just wanted to say that 
when did it become a priority to save the lives of the seniors and experiment on the younger on the younger crowd to do so um that seems very backwards to me um whatever happened to the women and children first philosophy um and we should be valuing the lives of the youth because a lot of these vaccines are being pushed onto the youth and the youth are experiencing effects like myocarditis and other health problems. So I feel that there has been a flip in the uh, moral compass of this city from the people that are saying that it's actually the seniors that are being selfish in wanting the younger people to be experimented on to, quote, save their lives. Thank you. Um, Francesca, are you, are you raising your hand? Okay. First, you have to unmute. You'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Thanks. I'm just here in support of what Gary, Karen, and Linda said. Um, and I think that people that have chemical sensitivity, they can have a card that, that explains that they, they can't be vaccinated or they can't wear a mask because of it. But, um, but everybody that can, sh I think, should be vaccinated. I won't go to the senior center until, until I know that people are vaccinated and using masks. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I can't say for the whole meeting. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone who has not spoken yet who would like to speak? Either wait, raise your virtual hand or wave at me. Um, let me just see if I missed anyone. Betty Lynn is raising her hand. Betty. You'll have to unmute, go ahead. I'm trying to. There you go. Okay, let's see. Okay, thank you. Um, these last couple of years, I've been calling my situation the CCC, and it stands for the COVID Cancer Combo. And as an immune compromised individual who lives by myself, I, you know, a few people said the importance of um, maintaining some sense of sociability. I used to be very active at the senior center and um, I, as so many others who have spoken, am not going to be able to utilize the um, senior center until it has um, the vaccine mandate in place. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, I wouldn't feel safe. And um, even with, with the things that are in place now, I would most likely, I'm not going to many public places at all, but if I were to go stay to see a movie at the senior center, most likely I would end up moving my chair to the farthest place so that I can be socially distanced in a way that feels safe to me. But I hope that the Board of Health will take to heart the um, testimonies from those that have spoken. And um, I hope that you'll, a vigorous discussion will follow. I appreciate all that you've done in this past almost two years. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Betty. Um, have we missed anyone? Anybody help me out, see if I, we missed anyone. Has everyone spoken who wants to speak? I don't see anyone, Joanne. I don't okay. see any hands raised virtually or physically. Thank you all so much for, for giving your comments. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's important for, for everyone's voices to be heard. Um, so now we will open the formal part of the Board of Health meeting. Um, it is 5.50 PM. Um, Welcome everyone. Um, tonight we have all of our Board of Health members, Suzanne Smith, Cynthia Swopis, Laurent Levy, and Joanne Levin, myself. Uh, we have a number of staff members from the Department of Health with us. 
Um, and this um, Zoom meeting is being recorded. Um, so we'll start with some data. Um, Vivian. Uh, Joanne, can, Joanne yes. pardon me. Can someone make a motion to open the Florida Health meeting? Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I move to open. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Lauren? Um, yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Vivian um, is one of the uh, incredible nurses at the Department of Health, and she has some data to share with us. There you go. I forgot to unmute myself, I'm sorry. And you can all see my screen. Yes, yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, so as you're probably aware, we have had an uptick in cases uh, representing a bit more than 80% increase in cases since where we were at at the beginning of the month. Um, in the past 14 days, we've had 77 new cases and counting. Um, that equates to an incident rate for our total population of nearly 19 cases per day per 100,000. Um, we're still seeing a higher incident of infection again, um, among our unvaccinated population, but we do still have um, breakthrough cases among our fully vaccinated population. Um, I did want to have us pay attention a little bit to our age breakdown in cases. We are, like the rest of the country, seeing that increase in pediatric cases. Um, and then there's a more comprehensive breakdown here at the bottom. Um, comparing our proportion of cases in the past 14 days versus our cases in this whole wave of infections that we've been experiencing since um, the beginning of July. So whereas prior, you know, our zero to 19 year old population maybe accounted for um, about 18% of our cases, now they're accounting for 28% um, of our cases. Um, down here, our more senior population, our 60 plus population accounts for 6% um, of our cases, whereas in this total wave, they've accounted for about 19% of our cases. Do we have any questions about this slide? Uh, and Vivian, do you... Um... I don't know if it's on your next slide. Um, the CDC um, uh, code for our county, the CDC. Um, yep, we are level. currently experiencing high transmission. I don't have that on my slide here. So that that um, applies to Hampshire County as a whole is experiencing um, high trans, um, rate of transmission, in the county, okay. which is the, the red transmission. Vivian, do you have a sense of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, through contact, contact tracing where these breakthroughs or unvaccinated are occurring, social events, restaurants, do we know, do we have any knowledge? <clears throat> um, so are you asking about breakthrough infections or unvaccinated? Uh, sorry, um, just the increase in infections, yeah, just um, in general, where everything's so happening. It's, it's a mix. We definitely have um, community spread going on. We have had a couple of um, outbreaks in residential settings that do account for cases, um, but we are definitely seeing community level spread going on. And that can be very difficult to pinpoint um, where that is occurring because for the most part, things are open now. Um, people are out and about engaging in social activity. We're indoors a lot more now with it being cold. Um, it's very hard to trace back exposure unless somebody can pinpoint, yes, I was exposed to this person. I know that they tested positive. I know that I was with them. Thank you. Um, Vivian, I would like to know about the breakthrough cases. Um, just anecdotally, um, I'm starting to hear of people who have breakthrough cases. And the ones that I know of all have school children. So I was wondering if you know if that's playing a role. We currently have really had, you know, limited to untraceable transmission in our schools and our public schools. Um, 
private schools and public schools, we have not traced um, transmission that definitely you know occurred in that setting. Um, I've seen breakthrough infections among all different you know age groups who have been fully vaccinated. Um, and then, you know, we are starting to see more evidence of reinfection as well. I think, you know, this virus is very um, hardy and has mutated. Um, it's hard to maintain total immunity against, you know, infection at a, as a whole. It's still really protecting well against infection. It's still protecting well against severe infection. Thank you. Next slide. Yes. Good. All right. So on to the good news. This this was the bad news. On to the good news. All right. So right now we're looking at eighty-seven percent of our population has had at least one dose of the COVID nineteen vaccine. So that's one of the three, um, and seventy-three percent of our population is now fully vaccinated, and that's actually seventy-five percent of those who are eligible to be vaccinated based on age have become fully vaccinated. Um, right now. Most of that partially vaccinated individuals per capita is our five to 11 year olds playing catch up. 56% um, of them as of last Tuesday were already fully vaccinated. I don't have this week's data yet that will be published on Thursday, but I can only imagine it's substantially higher than it was a week ago. Um, and let's see, so I do wanna pay attention since we're on this topic tonight of um, seniors and vaccines. We're looking at greater than 95% uh, vaccination coverage for our population who's 65 and older. All right, and then I know Dr. Levin, um, once we're done with this slide, I do have a slide that's a breakdown of our public school vaccination coverage. So do we have any questions about this slide? Yes, can you re-explain that? Uh, it's the second column from the right. So if I see 16 to 19 year old, 50%, and that 50%, that means that that age group is only 50% fully vaccinated? Yes. So that population does include um, 16 to 19 year olds, meaning that it does include um, college students who are living in the area and have listed this area as their address. Um, it does include um, young adults and teenagers who um, are not in our public school system. So in, our, in my next slide, I'll go over um, our vaccine coverage for our high school is actually much higher um, than that general population number that we have. So you're saying that, it's assuming you, you, you're going to show as a high school slide, but if I see 50% here, you're thinking that by and large, these are not high school students. These would be college students who had gone somewhere else and, and uh, students that are not in the high school. Well, it's hard, it's hard to speak directly to that. I could only kind of derive that that's what's going on um, based on the vaccine coverage that we know we have for our um, high school. This is data as pr provided by MassDEP. Correct. I will say it's also based on data from the Massachusetts Immunization Database, which sometimes um, is not all inclusive. Um, sometimes vaccines are not reported. Um, so it could be it could have gaps, but that would be a pretty large gap to have. So if I'm a fresh a college freshman who was living in Northampton who went out of state for college, I would be part of that number because my address is still in Northampton. And I'm out of state, so I may be vaccinated, but it's just MassDEP doesn't know exactly, it, right? Yeah, you got if you got vaccinated outside of Massachusetts, it might not be reported to the database and therefore not included in the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other questions um, for Vivian on this slide? Okay. All right. And this is our Northampton Public Schools. I don't have a breakdown of data for other schools such as Smith Vocational School. Um, we have really high vaccination rates for our 
seventh through 12th grade, I would say they're pretty outstanding. Um, we still have data to come for our five to 11 year olds as they begin getting their um, second doses in the next few weeks and then become fully vaccinated. Um, and that does explain our sixth grade being so low. Um, most of those kids are still 11, um, turning 12. So they only just became eligible to be vaccinated. Excellent, thank you for, and do and, um, you think this is updated information? I mean, how up to date is this, you think? This, this right here, this table, this is accurate as of the end of October. So I can only imagine um, sixth grade is going to be much higher soon as the 11 year olds get their vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is seventh through 12th grade probably hasn't changed that dramatically since the end of October. Um, uh, I, I'm just seeing this in isolation, but this appears pretty remarkable to me. Um, how does this compare to neighboring school districts? I think we've been told we have some of the higher vaccination rates um, and already for five to 11 year olds, I think, I think we have one of the higher rates in the state. Do you I'm, know, oh, sorry, I'm go ahead. Surprised. Do you, do you know approximately what is the size of a class? A class, well, I think the high school has, I wanna say 900 kids just about. Um, so maybe divided by four is 225, is that right? Yeah, math. <laughs> you know, it would be really interesting. I don't know, that I, I, I'd have to think about it more, but if you have a 16 to 19 proportion of the population that's only 50% vaccinated and 11th and 12th grades that are close to 90% vaccinated. I, I just want to know if we can quickly do a math exercise to figure out whether the data is wrong or if it's possible, that's all. Because I just find, you know, I'm just wondering is, that means all the vaccinated happen not to go to the high school. <laughs> it's just something that's bizarre to me when you have a 50% rate there and a 90% on the other. I, I think that there's a gap that exists because, um a lot of that 16 to 19 year old, that includes two years there, the 18 year olds and the 19 year olds were not included, um, you know, the older 18s and the, the 19 year olds were not included in the high school group. And maybe that's where the disparity is happening. But would you think it's reasonable to think there'd be a cliff, a cliff between the 17 year olds and the 18 year olds? I well, <laughs> once they're outside of guardianship from their parents, I don't know. These are two different data sources, correct? Nope, they're both from MIAS. These, are, these aren't just Northampton data. This is Northampton Public School. Northampton. But, but, but the public school data. Yeah, come, I mean, it from. could include school choice, uh, but okay. that, there are a few kids. Is and there... the, the previous data on, on age groups, don't they come from two different sources? They both come from the immunization database. Okay. Do you have a way of figuring out the actual number of people in Northampton between the age of 16 and 19? Yes. I can. Do you know that number offhand or we'd have to look <laughs> I don't up. know that number offhand. I could stop sharing my screen and find it really fast. It's You're just something to think about because if it's, you know, if it's exceeding largely the 900 kids or the 225 per age group, you can probably do some math about whether it's working or not. Let me... Whether the data is working? Yeah, let's say your your group of sixteen to nineteen. If it's about a two, it's about two thousand. Then I, I can I can start to understand because you got a, a thousand kids unaccounted for that are not within the high school. Yep, it is two thousand one hundred ninety four. Two thousand one hundred ninety four. So the fifty percent that's fully vaccinated are all at our public schools. <laughs> but that seems to be almost almost odd, though. That I, I don't know about to re, we're not going to resolve this. But you have, um, you know, high school students that are all getting vaccinated, and another fifty percent of this age group that's not getting vaccinated at all. So that we're getting the average of about fifty percent. 
Well, but if they are vaccinated out of state, our system won't know it. Yeah. So I think there's a problem with the data there. So I think it's a gap. Yeah. Uh, Vivian, can I just ask you one quick question um, about um, that terminology, fully vaccinated? My understanding is the CDC um, is defining that as the two shots. And if you have the booster, that that doesn't mean, well, it doesn't mean you're fully vaccinated because you've had the two, but that's the that's the definition we're going by when we say fully vaccinated, two shots, right? <clears throat> so it, or Johnson and Johnson one. Right. So um, you to be fully vaccinated, you need to have a complete series and it needs to be at least 14 days from your the final dose in that series. For the Janssen vaccine, that's one dose. And for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, that's your two doses. Um, at this time, you do not need a booster dose or a third dose to be considered fully vaccinated, even if it's, you know, the CDC recommendation that you should get a booster or a third dose. And we'll see and, if that if that definition changes over time, but that's the current definition. And Dr. Levin, I was just wondering, we might want to remind folks, I, I see um, a hand up or someone mm -hmm. trying to speak just yeah, just a reminder to the public that this um, that this meeting, this part of the meeting is for the board members only and not for the public. Um, so, but you're welcome to uh, to listen. Um, okay, so, um, over Dr. Levin, where are we? Joanne, can you yes. hear me? Yes. Sir. For whatever reason, my screen went black again when Vivian stopped sharing. But I feel like if we looked at Amherst data set that um, they too were seeing this differential in that age group and it had to do with the college students also. So that's something that we can look closely at, um, Vivian and I can, um, with our college students in that population. Yeah, because otherwise the data doesn't make much sense. Right, but it, it definitely mimics uh, Amherst and what they were seeing. Also, the 20 to 29 group is has low vaccination rate, and mm -hmm. some of that are the college years or, you know, potentially graduate school, but not, but there's probably a lot fewer people in college in that age group. Um, so I don't know, do you have an explanation for that age group? 20 to 29, 54% vaccinated? It's got to be a couple of years of college students, at least. Yeah, a couple of years. But. So, I, I mean, just anecdotally, because I have three children that are in that age group who are all vaccinated, I'd like to say, but um, their friends, they have many friends, especially women um, who feel like they are choosing not to get vaccinated because they're in their reproductive years and they don't want to do anything that may, you know, that they feel that they ha don't have enough information on on what could happen in the future. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that number is a little bit more likely to be accurate. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, any other, um, thank you so much, Vivian. Any other um, comments about this data? Um, I'd like to move on. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, that's very interesting though. Um, so just as a standing item, um, <clears throat> To review the um, the uh, regulations and recommendations that we do have in place, um, I thought we could discuss the indoor mask mandate. Um, <clears throat> and um, any thoughts about that? So I cannot see anyone, but I think Vivian's data that she provided us at the beginning, showing where we're at with community transmission. Um, kind of should lead the conversation or, you know, to, to keeping the mask mandate in effect until we are on the other side of this new mini surge that we're in again. I don't feel like now is the time to um, lift any public health strategies that we have in place. Meredith, just, just so you know, we can see you. Even oh, you can? Okay. You can't see yourself. <laughs> I cannot see anything. It's back again completely. You can't see us? Nothing. Oh, mm -hmm. do you want to log out and log in again? I don't think I can unless I make someone a host. I could do that. Yeah, I will do that. I'll make you the host, Joanne, and then I will log out and log in again. Okay. Um, any other comments from uh, board members? 
Um, other than to say I would agree with that recommendation. Hard, hard to imagine lifting a prevention strategy when rates are rising. Lawrence, did you want to comment or? Well, I, I, I've, I've, I've gone out of town a few times and was quite intrigued by uh, the fact that there were no mass mandate in indoor situation, like including IKEA, for example, in Staten. And uh, yeah, it certainly is a little bit frustrating to be designated as this rogue city that, that wants to keep their mass mandate. But rates are rising, and somehow we're aware that they would be rising. So I don't think there's a reason to change. And by and large, I don't think the if plenty of people came and commented during a, a, a board of health meeting that the masks are uh, not something that they want to do because A, B, and C, but by and large, people are supportive of, of the mask mandate, as far as I can tell. So I, I, I have a hard, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, in, I'm, I'm not inclined to, to change that at this time. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm also in agreement with that plan. Um, and not the last meeting, but the meeting before or sometime over this summer, we wrote a letter um, addressed to local businesses, um, including uh, the city of Northampton to the mayor, uh, about a recommendation for um, <clears throat> that business owners um, recommend uh, a vaccine requirement uh, for their employees. Um, Meredith, we can see you. Can you see us? I can. Excellent. <laughs> um, so Meredith, about the employee vaccine recommendation, can you just give us a summary of what happened to that letter since um, we wrote it? Sure. Yeah, we wrote it in September, um, signed it uh, October 4th, all the Board of Health members signed it. Um, we gave it to the mayor on October 5th. We put it out to the public on so social media the same day, October 5th. And recently we um, actually mailed a copy to uh, everyone who's permitted to do business with the city, with the health department. So that letter went out again. Um, so we've been putting the letter out there. Um, the mayor, um, I think, has been um, thinking hard about um, execution of what we're asking. I think there is timing that's involved. I think there is a lot of negotiations with many different unions that are involved, but I do know that it is on his, his radar. Any um, comments? Um, Meredith, do you remember if this went out as a press release? Because I don't think it was picked up by the Gazette. No, uh, I checked our records. It didn't go out as a press release. And during the minutes, it was recorded that I was waiting until um, the, if the city was going to adopt this policy, I wanted to send that out in tandem with a cover letter to our letter, um, the executive document that the mayor was going to write. And I okay. see that the mayor is on. I'm not sure if he wants to speak. I have no control. I can see you, but I still can't control anything else. Yes, I'm. I'm here. Um, so, with regard to the um, to the vaccination mandate, uh, we have had obviously had multiple conversations with Meredith. Um, it is a mandatory subject of collective bargaining, um, and we have seven collective bargaining units on the city side, and um, we are about to enter into collective bargaining with all of them um, for the next fiscal year. We also have several other issues related to collective bargaining. Um, and so um, it is a, uh, and we're also in the middle of a transition right now. So um, for those reasons, um, it's, um, it is not, uh, I cannot simply implement the mandate. It's not, an, it's not a subject of impact bargaining. It's actually a subject of collective bargaining. So I can't implement something and then bargain the impact. This is a purely collective bargaining issue. So. Um, I have been, this has been a subject of our transition meetings with mayor elect uh, Shara, um, but because we're dealing with multiple 
collective bargain related issues, including ARPA funding uh, for city employees, which is also a subject of collective bargaining. Um, we uh, wanted to do this in a more universal way rather than attempting to open up collective bargaining for one issue. Um, uh, so that is sort of where we are with that issue right now. On the school side, um, there's one unit that, uh, which I'm the chair of the school committee, there's one union that um, negotiates on behalf of the seven or eight different um, school units. Um, and they actually uh, were, um, they were in favor of it and requested it. So it was a much quicker negotiation uh, between the school committee and NACE. Um, it was a one meeting negotiation. Um, other than working out all the exceptions for religious and medical. Um, so there is one on the school side, um, but that was a, a different um, situation and a different collective bargaining um, a set of collective bargaining units. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, members, any comments or questions? Well, um, can, go ahead. No, please. No, I just was curious whether are they um, bargaining units that are less favorable to a mandate than others? So I, I, I really can't discuss collective bargaining on a public Zoom meeting. Um, I, I do believe we have a really high rate of vaccination among employees um, in Obviously, our first responders were among the first to get vaccinated early on, um, and um, and we have a I think we have a fairly high rate um, as it is. But in terms of those conversations, I I those have to be part of collective bargaining, and I would be probably subject to an unfair labor practice if I started discussing it with the board of health. <laughs> so, thank you. Any other questions or comments? So I just I just hope um, we continue to pursue this. Um, we are asking and have asked our businesses to do a lot for what we believe are very, very good reasons. And um, I would just love us to um, be able to set an example as one of the one of the employers in town as well, um, fully acknowledging the difficulty in um, negotiation. So I just want to put that on the record so we don't. In transition, a lot of things can get lost and there'll be some very busy months with a new mayor. So I just hope we, we keep it, uh, keep this discussion going. Mayor, I do have a question. Do you know if the OSHA ruling goes through? I know it's in the courts now, but if the OSHA ruling goes through, how does that differ or impact um, collective bargaining? Like The analysis we've been given at um, by the state level is that Massachusetts, there's a certain subset of states that are either part of OSHA or not part of OSHA um, and fit into, um, we're, we're, we're in a state where we have, um, a, we have agreed to follow the rules of OSHA, but we're not a fully opted in OSHA state. Um, so the analysis that we've heard, um, and this is coming from like, you know, National League of Cities and Mass Municipal, is that uh, unless OSHA changes its regulations that we wouldn't necessarily be automatically opted in. Um, there are some situations though, um, I was talking with our fire chief, I don't think this is gonna be an issue for this department, but that, that apparently some Medicare and Medicaid regulations are now requiring it for caregivers at a federal level if you receive any reimbursement. Um, so for example, our, our EMTs, which, um, you know, do transport patients and we do have Medicare and Medicaid patients. Um, so that may be one area where there'd be mandatory. But again, my chief tells me that, um, you know, they have a high, pretty high compliance rate. They're, they're, all their EMTs were among the earliest to be vaccinated. But the OSHA one is still a little bit of an open question. But right now, we are not a state that is considered um, that if OSHA mandated this, that we would have to follow it or we would be mandated at the at the local level to follow it as part of OSHA. So that wouldn't overrule collective bargaining, I guess is what I'm saying, if that's the premise of the question. Yes. I didn't know that people could opt out of OSHA or a state could opt out of OSHA. Um, so that's interesting. <clears throat> Any other? 
Well, they, to the extent that they have their own system in place with regulation that are probably as least as, as constraining as the federal OSHA. I see. Any other questions or comments? Um, how do we want to proceed? Is there anything else we want to do with this letter that we've written? It's gone out, as Meredith said, to permitted businesses, um, but that's not all business. Um, we want to put it out as a press release. Is there anything else you want to do with that letter? Or can it be sent to the Gazette as a letter to the editor? Yep, you can do that. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. And a press release. Anything else? Okay. Great. Um, uh, the last item of old business is about the Board of Health uh, vacancy. Meredith, can you just update us to where we are with that? Um, I. Uh, yes, so we've posted, uh, we've, we revised our job description for the Board of Health member, and after that revision, we posted it on social media, the city website also um, put the new job description on their website, and I think to date we've gotten about nine applicants um, who are interested in becoming a Board of Health member. So I asked um, last month or so about uh, thinking about bringing on a new or appointing the mayor appointing a new board of health member and um, the mayor's chief of staff Alan had gotten back to me to let me know that they're thinking about how to do this either the mayor and the new elects doing it tandemly or waiting until the new mayor is on board. Um, and that's the latest that I got uh, for information on that. I, Mayor, I don't know if you want to add anything. Oh, hold on. <laughs> there Sorry, you go. I'm, I'm used to, I was trying to unmute myself. So we were muting and unmuting me. Right. Um, so uh, well, I actually, my, my last count shows that there were four applications. I'm not sure about the other five, unless those came directly to you. I, I checked our file today. Um, essentially, I made, a, um, I made appointments after, uh, leading up until the election, but I have, not, I have not made any other appointments to boards and committees. And I believe that you know, now that the mayor elect <clears throat> has been elected and there's a transition in place, that it, it's not really my place to begin um, filling boards and um, committees with appointees in my remaining 40, you know, 40 or 50 days left in office. Um, there's also a logistical cha challenge too, because the city council process of referral to committees and that are required by charter. So we're sort of running out of time in that regard. So my position, I've made some final um, appointments um, in October, um, but I believe that as we now transition into a new um, mayor that really it should be their purview um, beginning a new administration to make those appointments. So we are already working with the mayor elect, our staff in terms of providing her and her team with information about vacancies and applications. Um, so our expectation is that mayor elect Shara will be ready to hit the ground running with appointments in January. Cynthia? Um, so, as some of you know, I've been pressing this issue for a long time. I think it's two years that we have not had a, a fifth Board of Health member, if not at the very least a year and a half. And I appreciate, Mayor, um, you not wanting to make the appointments at this current time. Um, we, are, we are at a point of having four board members, and if we run into a two-two tie on any vote, I'm concerned about that, particularly during the pandemic. And um, secondly, I just um, want to urge us to move as quickly as possible on this, on, on, on reviewing the applications. And just for the record, um, we have had conversations about having um, a BIPOC or person of color member on our board. It's, it's so important with the, as we all know, what um, um, the, the topic of health disparities and how that impacts us. And um, 
I, I also think um, we're lacking um, an individual with a mental health background, and we're seeing now a lot of situations and um, 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 examples of how mental health plays a huge role in, in our ability to do de our deliberation. So I just want to go on the record and, and just say those are a couple of gaps at the board, and um, whatever we can do to move this quickly through um, from the application phase to the city council phase, that would be fantastic. So thank you for the work so far. And um, um, if there's anything we can do to help, that would be great. So Cynthia, just so everybody is aware, you know, um, Bill left right before the pandemic hit. And during the pandemic, the entire time, I asked if we put a pause on bringing a new board member on because we didn't have the capacity to onboard a new member properly, even to just go over the rules and what the Board of Health does. I found that that was not the time to bring a new member in. So, I, I mean, I, I'll take all, you know, blame for lack of better word on that. Um, and then we just came back to revisit this a couple months ago. And like the mayor said, you know, with the transition with the new mayor elect, when I approached him um, to start having discussions again, this is, this is where we lay. But it was clearly, you know, my decision or my request that we just put a pin in it for a while. Yeah, th thanks. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Meredith, for reminding me of that. And no blame intended. It's, um, please, uh, I'm not going to blame Meredith O'Leary for anything. <laughs> um, but um, I, I appreciate um, you reminding me of that, that we did want to pause. Um, so I, I hope we're in a better position to move forward. So thanks for rekindling this idea. And as you know, I'll probably sure. stay on it all the time. So thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments about this? Just, just one comment. I, I recognize it's a little tricky for uh, the mayor to name someone on his way on his way out, and certainly we should wait for the new mayor. But that's not going to be the new mayor's first order of business. So we probably are still a few months away from the next member. I mean, I have a hard time thinking she'd have she'd prioritize uh, nominating a new board member as first item on January third. <laughs> So we'll see what happens, but I'm a little bit pessimistic that something will happen until before May or March. And it's also, I think it's also from having the experience and being the, new, the, the newest board member, I, I recall the, the long wait when you apply, say, months and months earlier, the frustration that can be among a candidate because it's really sort of implies that the, the institution doesn't work very well and it takes a lot of time to wait. Whereas, you know, if you apply for a job in business, usually a matter of weeks, as opposed to month. So that's my, you know, my opinion about this. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Mayor, for your input and Meredith. Um, okay, new business. Um, senior center vaccination requirement. Um, we've heard a lot of testimony from the public requesting that there be a vaccine requirement at the senior center. We have invited um, Marie Westberg here. She is the director of the senior center. Marie, I'm gonna unmute you. Thank you for coming. Oh, there you go. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so, um, I know you sent a letter to our board members today. Did everybody receive that? Suzanne, did you see that yet? Uh, if, if, if it came today, I haven't seen it. Okay. Um, Marie, would you, um, sort of summarize your, your thoughts? Um, sure. I, um, so you know, thank you for, for having me and um, to talk about this. I, um, I am not in favor of requiring vaccinations to enter the Northampton Senior Center. Um, and the mayor concurs with that. Uh, as a publicly funded agency uh, providing a wide range of services to Northampton residents age 55 and older, 
Um, we, we provide programs for people who are coming voluntarily and under the same Department Health of Health directives that the rest of the city follows, um, as well as for other municipal buildings, is the same. Um, to date, the Health Department has not ordered any proof of vaccination to be required for public access to other municipal buildings or offices, and no other senior centers uh, have a met vaccine mandate other than the town of Hadley, which is requiring a vaccine uh, for all entry into all of its buildings, its town buildings. Uh, my staff and I share your concern and, and the, the concerns of our patrons about keeping seniors safe and healthy. Um, we do a lot to promote health and wellness of seniors. It's part of our primary mission at the Senior Center. Because we serve so many low income and at risk seniors, however, we also put a major focus on ensuring equity and access to our services and programs. The Senior Center plays a vital role for seniors who face isolation or lack transportation or the financial means to access cultural programs or social and health services. We work hard to ensure that there are no barriers to accessing the vital services and programs we offer. So we urge the Board of Health to be mindful of the potential disproportionate impacts that any new restrictions may have on access. Um, Northampton seniors are not the only beneficiaries of important services that we offer at the Senior Center. We serve a lot of low-income families through our bound brown bag program and wel welcome people of all ages for public events such as flu clinics, election day voting, the winter farmer's market, arts night out, first night, and more. Many of these activities do not sub, um, would not be subject to vaccination requirements and other non-municipal ven venues. So requiring a vaccination check to accept, access them at the senior center may be prohibitive for some community members wishing to attend. It also would make it challenging to run specific events due to the potential logistical challenges of monitoring, ac monitoring access to multiple events being run by multiple groups at any given time. We have three entrances into the building. Um, one is in the rear, one is in the front, and one is on the, the side entrance providing direct access to our fitness center. Uh, any the staffing that would be needed to check vac vaccination records of every person entering the building would be challenging. And it certainly would be beyond my department's capacity. For some of our busier programs, it would potentially create lines of people outside of the senior center in cold and inclement weather waiting to access the building. I have also been informed by the health director that recording and storing vaccination data is not something we can legally do. So this effectively means that proof of vaccination would need to be provided each and every time someone entered our facility. Senior services staff and volunteers are not medically trained to screen vaccination records and we would need to rely on the Department of Health staff to manage this process, potentially through its successful COVID-19 ambassador program. Uh, finally, some organizations or institutions requiring vaccination have provisions for medical and religious exemptions, or in some cases, the ability to receive proof of a negative COVID-19 test in order to gain entry in the absence of vaccination. If similar exemptions are envisioned as part of a senior center vaccination mandate, the details of how such exemptions will be reviewed and by whom should be developed in advance of the, by the Board of Health. Similarly, if COVID-19 testing is a, co a component of any vaccination requirement at the senior center, the Board of Health will need to develop comparable pro comparable protocols as well as hopefully provide seniors access to testing. Um, as of this week, senior staff, uh, senior center staff, we have completed over 750 renewal appointments with our members. This process is required before any senior can return to the center, as clearly many are motivated to do. Although we do not ask about our require or require proof of vaccination, many members have volunteered that they are vaccinated. No matter what their vaccination status, we continue to focus on preventative measures such as masks and social distancing, 
while also providing flexibility in the ways members can access programs and services. We are continuing to offer a wide, a wide range of remote programming options via Zoom for those who do not feel comfortable coming to the senior center in person for whatever reason. I, I appreciate the opportunity to share my concerns about the potential negative impacts, barriers to access that a municipal facility vaccination requirement focused only on the senior center may create. Um, should the Board of Health choose to order a vaccination mandate at the senior center, it's my sincere hope that the administration and staffing requirements needed to operate such a compliance effort will be the responsibility of the health department. The senior center does, does not have the staffing, training, or budget to implement such a program. So those are my thoughts. Um, I don't know if anyone Wants to, wants to ask me any questions about those, but, but um, I think that covers pretty much everything that um, I'm concerned about at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody have um, questions or comments? Yeah, I have uh, two. The first is about the masking policy at the senior center. I imagine that, um, the monitoring of masking oftentimes falls to volunteers who are working at the senior center. Is that is that true? Um, no, staff are doing um, consistent rounds, um, and we do you know we do um, not only in the renewal appointments but uh, in daily reminders to people. We are letting, you know, reminding people that they need to keep their masks on. We we do have, um, you know, occasional uh, people who are, you know, sort of a little looser around that. Um, it's generally the same people in the same room, um, but yes, it, it it is in effect. And um, although uh, you know there have been some recent reports, I think. Um, about this specific group of people. Um, generally, we're finding that everyone complies with the mandate. Um, and we haven't had any people say they are not willing to wear a mask, of course, so. Well, there's wearing masks and there's appropriate wearing of masks. And I have heard from a number of people that a lot of folks are in there without the mask over their nose, which is equivalent to not wearing a mask. So right. well, yeah, we don't we don't um, we don't check them every you know few minutes. We can't really do that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's an issue everywhere. And um, although we we do check each room very often, mm -hmm. um, that does happen. Well, I think it's important that. The mask be worn correctly, no matter where we are. Um, and the second thing is, is there something in the agreement that people are signing as they rejoin about not asking anyone else about their vaccine status? Is that in the, the language? It's not in, uh, people do not sign off on anything that has that language in it. It is in our COVID-19 safety guidelines that we, we don't want people to feel um, that they are being policed by their peers. And we did get a lot of questions from people um, about whether the group, uh, for instance, um, some groups wanted to make their group vaccinated people only. And we said, you know, that's not a mandate that's in effect. And so uh, we want you to leave the, the um, policing to us. You know, we will be, we will be uh, talking to people about their masks, but there's not a mandate in effect. And so we, want, we don't want people standing outside of a room and saying, you can't come in <laughs> um, because that is not, um, you know, if that's just not welcoming behavior, so. Thank you.
Other questions or comments? Um, I'm honestly, if Amherst Cinema can pull a vaccine card check or Iron Horse can do it, um, there's no reason the senior center cannot do it. And I mean, do we need three entrances to the senior center? I mean, airplanes have four entrances and we still get through one. I mean, is there any reason you can close two and check at one? Um, no, it's just that we do, when, when there are multiple events going on in the building, um, for instance, uh, the flu Clinton clinic happening or the voting was happening, uh, we have people coming in to the senior center where the seniors are, like for instance, this year we closed the senior center during voting because, because we have people coming in from all different ways. Like people are coming from the great room where voting is happening into the lobby of the senior center because there are fire doors that can't be, they can't really be locked. So um, um, anyway, that I just think that the issue really is it's always chaotic and hard to, to control where people are going and coming through doors. People go out the fitness store and let people come in through the fitness store. So, you know, it's logistically, it's difficult to, under normal circumstances, to, um, to deal with these kinds of things. So my concern is if it's going to happen, it needs to be done, um, it needs to be done properly and it will, it will impinge upon other things that we may be able, we, we may not be able to do. Um, you know, like, like brown bag, for instance, um, we have, uh, I think 150 people who come for groceries. And during the pandemic, those groceries were handed out outside in the parking lot. But now people come into the building to get those groceries. And I, my concern is that, um, you know, and these aren't just seniors, these are low income people from, from all over the city. And I, I don't want those people standing out in cold weather in a line waiting to get their vaccination status checked when I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, based on your statistics that you, your data that you shared tonight, that, that pretty much all those people, you know, are, are vaccinated. So um, I want to provide the services that we need to provide to people who really need them. And I don't want there to become barriers to serving the people that we're meant to serve. Thank you. Especially um, if, if everyone's already vaccinated. Um, I'll just comment uh, two things. Um, I can't remember the second one. The first one is that uh, I work at Cooley Dickinson and during the height of the pandemic, I don't know normally how many entrances we have, probably more than 20 or 30. Uh, we were down to two entrances so that we could monitor masking on entrance. So if Cooley Dickinson can do it, I think the senior center could do it. And I'm wondering about fire doors. You can't lock them from the inside, but I don't know if you can lock them from the outside. Um, um, it's just the doors from the great room into the lobby. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm saying is that it's, it's not that it's impossible. I mean, it certainly is possible. It's going to create issues for many of the programs that we offer. And so it will require extra staffing to monitor that because I, in order for us to run the senior center properly and to provide the programs that we provide, our staff needs to focus on providing those things. I've uh, so the two other comments I had. One is, does the senior center, at least from what I gleaned from the website, the city website, the senior center has particular hours that are the senior center hours, even though the building is used for other functions at other times. Is that right? Is brown bagging, for example, that program at a different time or during senior center hours? No, that is a program that runs during our operational hours. And mm -hmm. those people are coming in, they are not members of the senior center? There are several programs that happen in our building that are open to people who are low income um, that are not just for seniors. Um, PVTA, for instance, comes 
to the building. And so um, an interfaith comes, interfaith services comes. And so that, you know, there are, there are, you know, it's meant to um, serve primarily people over 55, but it also, um, a lot of our programs overlap with high need populations. And the one other question I have is, um, have you, um, do you have a volunteer program? In other words, I think there are a lot of motivated community members who might be willing to serve as monitors at the door, for example. Have you engaged people? Do you have a, a, a volunteer service? We do have volunteers. I'm, I'm not sure that um, that's the proper, if that would be appropriate uh, in these circumstances. I mean, that's something that is, um, you know, the Board of Health, you, you decide, or Meredith decides how those things are done. Um, legally and operationally, it's not something that um, I could guarantee that we could have volunteers to cover every hour of every day. Let's, and these people are seniors, so I'm not sure that we should have them doing that job. Are there comments or questions, thoughts? Um, but, oh. yeah, go ahead. Uh, Marie, thank you for, for being here this evening. It's very helpful. Um, um, you were talking about the other activities that are in the building. Um, what if we were to do, and I know you have some other issues with this, but we would exclude those activities like the winter market and voting, et cetera, that uh, if we were to um, require a vaccine, it would only be during um, the hours that Dr. Levin mentioned, the, the actual senior center hours. And so I'm just wondering, it appears that it's mostly a staffing issue, but I was wondering if you could address the folks that we have been hearing from, um, people who say they, they cannot go to the senior center because of this fear that um, other people are not vaccinated or, or they just don't fear or whatever, or a level of comfort. What do we say to them particularly if we can get over this staffing issue, um, because I recently re-upped, re-registered, and um, it seemed pretty smooth for what I had to do. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think, um, I think that it's, it's up to the Department of Health, uh, what events are excluded if they are outside our operational hours. Um, seniors are going to those events also. Um, I think it could, you know, it could be confusing to the public. Um, I mean, I know, um, but I, that doesn't mean that it can't be done. I just, um, I think that you know, our, our uh, seniors are coming, you know, seniors are coming to the senior center and participating. Uh, I think people are scared and, and rightfully so. I mean, the breakthrough cases, you know, are concerning. So we, we're trying to do our best to provide space in a safe way by following the guidelines Meredith has given us around, um, you know, there's, there are additional requirements that people socially distance at, at the senior center um, in addition to wearing masks. And um, we, we, most of our groups, um, you know, there are a few that are meeting on site, but many, many of our groups are continuing to meet online because they're still not comfortable venturing out and coming to the senior center. And they're not saying that it's because of the vaccination mandate. They're saying it's because they're, they're still scared. Um, there's, you know, um, I think that the, the card players are the maybe one of the few groups that are asking for the mandate. So, um, you know, I think each, each group is having to make those decisions for themselves about whether they want to meet on site or not. And we are facilitating whatever they're comfortable with. Um, and in addition to that, we're really working hard on, you know, to provide, to provide um, a lot of online programming and tech support to do that. Um, but I think until the Board of Health is saying it's safe, 
to to go out and be in public. Um, I'm not sure that based on the vaccination data that we're um, that we're going to be safer if we make a vaccination mandate because it seems like um, it seems like everyone is vaccinated to me. But um, but you know I I haven't polled the people so. And and I was I was wondering too because um, I as I said I did re-register and. Um, there is a line in the document that I was given that said, I, as a member, I, I should not inquire about other members' vaccination status. So I just want to. Right. Yeah. That document was approved by the Department of Health as our safety guidelines to give to patrons. And it basically is just to prevent any bullying that might happen. Um, we just don't want people to feel, um, we, we want people to feel safe and comfortable at the senior center and, um, and, and to not have that element of sort of peers policing each other be, you know, impinging on the social dynamics because we've had issues around those kinds of things before and uh, things, things have been going smoothly um, and, you know, I think there's been some communi you know, some confusion about people remembering that line in there, but it's not meant to, it's not meant to, um, patrol or, um, dictate to people. It's really just about our code of conduct, which is that everyone should be respectful and kind to each other. It's, it's not meant to be, um, I think, the way that some people are taking it. Yeah, and it's, and, and they don't sign that. What they've signed is a waiver uh, that's the general city waiver for participation and uh, the code of conduct. Those are the things that they sign. So that, that line is not included in either of those documents that they sign. I just want to put the science out there a little bit um, just to document that people, even with Delta, people who are vaccinated are 20% um, um, have 20% the risk of uh, developing COVID and therefore transmitting disease. In other words, 80% um, decrease in risk. Um, and so I think vaccination um, does significantly decrease the risk um, to a group um, of developing disease and, and therefore also transmitting. Um, so even though we do see breakthrough cases happening and thankfully most, case, most people who get breakthrough cases um, um, are not hospitalized. Um, we do see some hospitalized. We have uh, at least our latest, the last statistics I saw at Cooley is that um, just out of interest that our breakthrough cases, we had no one who had died. Um, but we definitely have people hospitalized uh, with breakthrough cases, but the risk um, of developing a case is dramatically decreased with vaccination. And definitely since um, we have um, boosters, that's even dramatically um, more so. Any other questions or comments? Any um, for Marie or general discussion? I, I just... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Susan. I, I wanted to say that um, your efforts to be inclusive and welcoming um, and to reduce barriers are admirable. Uh, it, it's it's uh, impressive to hear that. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there is a large group that feels that they have a huge barrier to participation there because they can't be sure if people are vaccinated. And those are people who have health vulnerabilities and who probably need services more than anyone and, and the ability to socialize in a safe manner. And that's often who we've been hearing from. So I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that those people see this as a barrier to participation. Yeah, I understand that. I, I was wondering, um, 
how often are those events such as the winter market, uh, the bags, the, the brown bag you mentioned earlier, is that something that happens every day? Um, or is that, you know, a couple of times a week? I know this winter market is once a week. Uh, no, no, the brown bag and the nutritional outreach programs each happen once a month. And the farmer's market is happening bi-weekly. So it's fair to say that by and large, the senior center is used by seniors. Yeah, yes. I mean, but there are, there are events. Um, for instance, we had a um, gallery opening for the artist of the month recently and people traveled from out of state. Um, and, you know, so we, we do have, and Arts Night Out, we have the general public coming in. So, you know, there are events where uh, the general public is, is invited in. Um, but generally, you know, there aren't um, big crowds of people at the Senior Center right now as there have been in the past. It seems to me that it'd be reasonable to at the very least either have, and I think Cynthia, you pointed to this, either have a mandate um, outside of those special events. You know, I, I agree, maybe just difficult to enforce a, a carding at the entrance of a winter market or the brown bag. But we could at least have several hours during the day, daily, where those they'd be a, you know, you can only access the building if there's a mandate, if you are vaccinated. And it seems to me that you could close two doors, card at one. If you cannot find the staff, I'm sure you can find an army of uh, senior citizen volunteers that would be willing to do it based on the, based on the, the, the public comments that we had earlier during this call. So it seems to me that we, 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 we need to be focused on those who come to this meeting and ask for that. And it's the second month already. And, I, and I, just because other cities, other towns or other buildings don't have that doesn't mean we can't do it for this particular building. This just so that this is my opinion. And I'm, I'm tempted to ask this board to vote on a mandate immediately with some exceptions to be implemented by the Board of Health. But before that, I'd like to know, what is your opinion, Meredith? Ah, uh, um, <laughs> so, well, Mass General Law 111, Section 31 allows the Board of Health to adopt and enforce any reasonable health regulation. So you certainly have the authority to do so. Uh, Attorney Seawald confirmed that at our last meeting. Um, as I do feel strongly that vaccinations are the key to defeat the, defeat the pandemic, I don't necessarily believe that this is the approach by isolating one very small members only business. Um, I understand fully that seniors are at high risk for severe disease and seniors do use this facility, but we have pockets of all around the city of high risk populations outside of the senior center that also deserve our protections. They might live in a housing complex where the common areas, uh, elevators, game rooms, community rooms, laundry rooms are being used. Um, they may use or commute public transportation that's provided by elder services. They might visit establishments that uh, house maybe senior fitness groups, bridge clubs, a diner that caters to the senior populations, churches, libraries. I feel like, um, isolating the senior center is really not the right approach. I think if we're going to do or protect our high-risk populations, we have to have a broader stroke. Um, the data in Northampton is awesome for seniors uh, vaccination rates. I think Vivian said it was 95%, maybe even a little more that are fully vaccinated, 60 and above. Our community transmission is not our seniors right now, it's the children, but of course we're, we're afraid of the children bringing it home to the seniors. I feel there's more work to be done. And um, again, I am champion of, of vaccinations. So I, I don't want that message to get crossed here. I just figure, you know, um, public health is population health, community health, what, you know, we have a, a larger umbrella than just one building in the entire city. And I feel like that's getting lost. Can we start somewhere and do this? Absolutely. 
Um, but I feel like we need to get our, our larger caps on and be thinking more broadly about this. Meredith, you know, we all value your opinion um, and um, we're really happy to hear from you. Um, personally, I disagree with that um, because I think that we need to start somewhere. Um, and just because we can't take care of everybody in every locale um, doesn't mean we can't um, improve upon what we're doing um, in some places. Um, the other thing is that um, for the seniors, the seniors can choose to stay home and do online programming. We'd like, we'd like to get everybody back to a more normal life. And if providing a vaccine requirement enables more people to use the services in person, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And it certainly decreases risk. Um, I, to me, it seems like a win-win. Um, and because, you know, in a housing complex, for example, if you had a vaccine mandate, people live there, like they, there's no choice. But here, if in a place where they choose to go or not to go, each person can still make their own decision about their risk tolerance. Um, but there are options, there are options to not go. Um, it's not there, it's not where they live. Um, so I am supportive of a vaccine requirement um, at the senior center during the hours that the senior center is operational. I understand that the building is used for other purposes um, at other times, and we'd have to sort of talk about those details, but at least for some hours of the days when the seniors use the center, I would be in favor of a vaccine requirement. Would there be uh, a test out, uh, a testing option? Uh, I think there's some things that we should think about too, if that's the direction we're moving in. Could there be a testing option? And what about religious and medical exemptions? Anybody else wanna chime in? I, th I think the testing option, and Meredith help me on this one, is that that's sort of following the Academy of Music model, I think. and. Um, uh, but I hear testing's hard, or there's all kinds of, or, or Dr. Levin, maybe you can help me with this. You, you can't get it right away unless it's a, you know, a, a quick test, or you have to still make an appointment. Is it still, is that still the case to get a test? Is it still difficult? Well, so there are PCR tests and there are rapid tests. PCR tests, uh, uh, Ask Meredith to comment on the availability in town. I know through Cooley, you need a doctor's order. It's not particularly yeah. easy to get. The rapid testing, um, they're still expensive and they're not always available on the shelves. There's, there's been a shortage. Rapid testing um, doesn't answer the question, are you incubating COVID? It answers the question, are you highly infectious today? And I think they're a very good public health tool. Um, they're just cumbersome to use. You know, you have to swab, say, someone has to take down their mask, do it, swab their nose, someone has to do the test. Uh, they take 15 minutes. And Meredith does have some available. Um, and I do think that um, they're very useful, um, but they're only good for that day, for example. Okay. They're good for like 12 hours. Um, uh, Meredith, can you comment about availability of testing? Sure. So there are still stop the spread sites um, that are run by the state. We don't. Uh, the only one that we have here in Hampshire County is UMass right now. Um, the other ones are in Hamden County. Um, they're they're pretty accessible. They're you know I've been to them uh, once or twice a week every week. Just a because um, I'm a little neurotic, but b I also want to gauge um, how the system's working. And I don't encounter lines and I don't encounter long waits right now for results. So I think um, testing is available. The antigen tests aren't as reliable. Um, and again, they're just a, a capture a moment in time. So if that was going to be something that was considered, someone would have to do that every time upon entry, which um, you know, I don't know if we would have enough tests to be able to support that. As a health department, I am allowed to get tests and use them for these types of purposes. But um, obviously, I don't have the staff that would be able to, you know, work 
8 or 8.30 to 4.30 to um, do testing. Uh, Joanne, you brought up the point of the tests not uh, reflecting whether you're incubating or necessarily even infectious. Um, I hope people don't believe that um, requiring the vaccine cards to get in in any way um, is protecting people from breakthrough cases because it's not. And so if that is a concern, uh, I wonder if this, if a measure just requiring vaccination would have the effect that people want, which is to protect them from being infected. I see it as um, sort of equivalent to safe sex and safer sex. Um, there is no safe sex, but there is safer sex. Um, so we can pr provide a safer environment by requiring vaccination. As I just said, the science is that the, someone's risk of uh, getting COVID and transmitting COVID is dramatically decreased if they're vaccinated. Doesn't mean they won't have breakthrough infection, um, but it, it generally sort of brings the whole risk level down. Okay. But, um, but, but I worry about people getting a false sense of security. Yeah, I think um, I think that was one of the concerns that Marie um, conveyed to me when we we talked is that we wouldn't want people to believe that if everyone at the senior center was vaccinated um, that they could be carefree um, and know that everyone was COVID negative. And that's I agree that that's not true. And I think <clears throat> when if we were to do this program, I think we would want to highlight that point that there's still um, a chance of breakthrough infection. Um, although I think the chance of breakthrough infection appears to be declining rapidly with, for people who are boosted. Um, but again, things change rapidly over time and how long boosting will last, we, we just don't know right now. Um, but I think that is an important message to include. And Joanne, as mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of add on to that, um, when we're talking about fully vaccinated, are we talking the series of two or are we including the boosters also? I think that's something that should be thought about. I'm, my, I'm just my thinking is that, you know, which is why I asked Vivian the question, I guess we have to go with what the definition of fully vaccinated is right now, right? But that could change, which is the two, the two vaccines and one Johnson. Yeah, because I mean, I was, as a healthcare worker, I was vaccinated very early on. So I was eligible for a booster when they came out, but not everybody had their vaccine right away. Not everybody is eligible for a booster yet. Um, so I would be more in favor of using the standard definition of finishing your primary series. Um, and at some later date, if we wanna update that, um, maybe that would make sense at a later time. Any other questions, comments? Does anyone want to make a motion? I think Meredith also had on the table the exemption um, um, question. Did we want to get into that if we were to move forward or um, does anyone has any comments about that? So I, I looked really quickly when we were talking, the three places, Amherst Cinema, the Academy of Music, and Iron Horse. And in none of those three, I see any comments about exemptions. And in all three, I see full proof of vaccination or a PCR test within 72 hours prior to the showtime. So I am tempted to line up with those businesses and have fairly similar and do not make a comment about religious medical exemption. It's just my opinion, so. Mm -hmm. But agree on the PCR on the PCR test 72 hours prior to that. I know there are a lot of people getting, not a lot, but there are people getting medical exemptions that are bogus. Uh, true medical exemptions are really rare. Um, I mean, it's for people with serious allergy and otherwise there's really not, uh, there aren't not a lot of medical exemptions, valid ones. If um, we were to have a motion and take a vote, um, I'm just looking at process and procedure. 
Um, is that something that, um, I was just playing around with some language. Is that something we would have to write a, a, a policy for like we've had in the past and then um, discuss that at another meeting or are we in a position to kind of discuss wording at this meeting or I know we still need to take the temperature of where we want to go in this, but I just was curious about procedure. Um, I, think it, meeting. I think it depends on if we're, if we find language that we're all comfortable with, I think we can go ahead. If we find that the language is difficult and we need to discuss it further to refine the language, then maybe we should have another meeting. I did um, talk with Ellen Seawald about shared documents and, and how to, you know, for example, <clears throat> when we write a letter, if we said we like the theory of this letter, but, you know, two of us will work on a letter um, that we really, because we're working on a document um, that we have to call that a meeting or a subcommittee meeting to actually work on edits publicly. Um, so unless we come up with language that we're all comfortable with now, it might take another meeting to finalize. Um, but the intention of the motion, if you just include the bullet points, is enough to, to carry it through. Um, the language itself doesn't have to be worked out today for the execution of the, of the motion. We could also put a future start date on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's time to hash out the detailed language. And just another um, nuance, when the mayor was talking about um, negotiating with um, bargaining units, if we were to say the members of the senior center need to be vaccinated, are we permitted to make a leap that the volunteers and the staff and the employees of the um, senior center would need to be vaccinated as well. Is that something that's within our purview? I mean, I think it's within our purview, but I'm not sure about this collective bargaining conversation. I think Is that's a question for Alan Seawold. I did not ask him that question, but it certainly makes sense if we're trying to provide a safer space um, that the employees fall under this. Um, So I, I would have to ask um, the city solicitor about that, I think. Unless Mayor, unless you have a comment about that. Um, I would only say that Alan actually doesn't do our labor law. He's our general city solicitor. We have a separate labor council because it's a whole other area of law. Um, I, again, I, um, it, uh, I do not believe that, um, the Board of Health could um, override collective bargaining. So it would be something we would have to discuss. I, I, I think all of our staff are vaccinated. I don't know if Marie can confirm that. I cannot, I don't know anything about the volunteers because they're volunteers. And so, um, so, but yeah, I do not believe, um, I know that you've seen court cases and you've seen, you know, things challenged in courts and courts have basically shot them down like, you know, prison guards and other people, but that's basically the court saying, we're not gonna intervene. You have to collectively bargain this. That's essentially what's happened in those cases. Like we are not going to supersede that um, and then join um, the governor in that case from implementing something, but he still had to collectively bargain uh, with all of those unions. So that would be one other logistical thing we'd have to talk to our labor attorney about as well. Thank you. And I, and I just, before I sign off, I just appreciate that you're thinking about all these implications because it sounds easy. Um, and I know that, you know, it's easy to say Iron Horse is doing it. Um, if you go to the Iron Horse and you think you're at a show where everybody's been truly vax checked, good luck with you on that one. Um, um, uh, you know, there've been big concert outbreaks recently because supposedly they're checking vax status, but um, it's not necessarily happening. And these are private businesses. These are not public, public buildings that, you know, um, so that's the, the other challenge we have. So I, I just hope that you will allow time to have the health department work out the logistics of these, um, of these issues around. I heard somebody asking about multiple chemical sensitivity 
um, earlier and whether there'd be an exemption for someone in that condition. There's just, there's many different paths that you can be sent down. Um, and again, the senior center staff is in the business of doing senior services, um, not public health and not administering um, this type of a, of a mandate. So they're, they're gonna need a lot of support, whatever you decide. And I just need to add, the health department cannot provide the support and, um, you know, be the enforcing arm of the senior center building. Like that is not logistically possible. So there really needs to be some thought behind this and how it's going to be implemented, but it can't fall under the health department. We don't have the staff or the resources for that. Uh, I, I view it as, you know, I would any business if there was a vaccine mandate, they're in control of the facility and they would have to do it. And I, I know as, re, you know, as Marie said, they too don't have the resources, so. Other comments? Does anyone want to make a motion? Uh, we'll make a motion. Um, what I'd like to have a sense, I think I have something in my head, but I'd like to know the opinion of other members of the board about whether to impose that at all times, uh, with the exception of special events such as winter market, or should it be something like 75% special hours during which vaccine mandate is in place, representing, I don't know, at least 50% of the time or something. What are your thoughts about this? And, yeah, and, I and I'm, so, I'm suggesting this because it may be easier to implement Implement if it's there's a window of time during which it takes place. That window could be adjusted. Kind of a you know a swimming pool where there's only a category of people going to that swimming pool at a particular time, um, as opposed to a, you know it's like this all the time. Yeah, I mean, if I'm following your logic, Laurent, it's um, the senior center is operating as a senior center during certain hours and maybe even some evening hours because of the honoring of the artist of the month. And so when it is operating under that senior center um, um, guise or, or, or um, framework, then um, that would be the time that the, the vaccine mandate would be in place. Not for a winter market, not for municipal voting, not for um, anything else that that facility could be used for. And I don't, I don't know what all those other options might be, but I, I would say it's in the interest of protecting the members whose voices we have heard loud and clear. Um, and also, um, trying to decrease the public health issue of isolation, you know, and so it's when they're partaking in those activities that, that in my mind, that's what I think where the mandate can be restricted to. Um, Marie, can you, um, I asked you earlier, but I, I just would like a clarification. The, some of the special events, like the brown bag event that happens once a month, is that during the hours of the senior center or is that on a weekend or evening when it's not senior, senior center hours? Oh, do I have to undo you? Yeah, sorry. Um, that, ha that happens during our operational hours because it's for seniors and the general public. So can you think of other events besides the brown bag event that happens during your hours other than like an art show that's part of your programming? Um, well, I mean, I'm sure I'm not thinking of everything now, but um, I mean, for instance, in October, like we had um, Hampshire Music Club 
brought in, you know, their members for a concert that they, we partnered with them for. And so um, sometimes there are people coming in who aren't members of the senior center and they're coming in for a one-time event. So, you know, we'd have to look at those things on a case by case basis and decide whether we should have certain things happen or not. And we might decide that it's better not to have certain things depending on the logistics. I can imagine that, that uh, part of your programming, for example, bringing in musicians or artists, you could tell them ahead of time that there's you know, vaccine requirement and then they of can course. decide if they're able to comply or not. But things, something like the brown bagging uh, event might fall outside of that. That's not really your programming specifically for your seniors. That's a community event, um, even though it's during your senior center hours. Right. So are you saying we would waive the mandate for that event or? Yeah, I mean, I could see it being waived for certain community wide events and for things that are outside of your regular hours. Um, but there may be sounds like there are some community programs that do fall within your senior center hours. So we might need to specify those or somehow have language about those being exempt. Yeah, I mean, I think it gets complicated when you start exempting. So, because we, so like Interfaith, PVTA, Northampton Neighbors, you know, there there's many nonprofits that come and do office hours um, at the senior center, and so um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure how that would work if, uh, say, like PVTA or will make appointments with people to come and do their bus pass applications on site. Um, uh, elected officials like uh, Joe Comiford, you know, people like that hold office hours. And so people will meet in our building. So we, you know, we may have to look at each of those things and decide um, whether we need to pause things like that, which um, in some instances, you know, might not be hard for those people to see other, see people elsewhere, but in some instances it may not be possible. Um, so, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, we can't help those people in some way, you know, over the phone or whatever, but, um, you know, those, those are my, you know, those were my concerns really is that I just don't want those people who come to our facility to get served by certain um, resources won't be able to get them. Um, and then if brown bag is uh, one of the events that's exempt from vaccination, then, um, then we would need to make sure everyone understood that. Um, you know, I, I guess we could, <laughs> we would, we would have to, you know, have people at the door saying, you know, right now is um, there are people in the building who, you know, we're not checking vaccination status for this time period. You know, it, it's it's complicated, but um, that doesn't, you know, I, I just it's logistically complicated. <laughs> complicated. I think doing the exemptions is very, very complicated. And I'm just wondering if it's, um, if we say something all visitors and vendors, um, individuals that assist people with their computers and um, other, um, other things that you mentioned, Marie, that, you know, the Joe Comerfords or the PVTA, that those individuals be um, vaccinated as well. I don't know if that's a reach. Um, well, yeah, I mean, like, I. I don't know if the Y, I mean, we have a contract with the Y for our exercise classes and uh, we're trying to bring those classes back in person um, and have a hybrid option. But you know, I did give them a heads up that, that it was possible that that would be um, an issue. And so they would then have to mandate their staff if they haven't already, I don't know. Um, it's just that, um, you know, the, the contractors and the, the city staff coming into the building. Um, you know, we have all kinds of city staff coming into the building and that if that collective bargaining stuff hasn't worked out, then, um, you know, those are other issues to cons 
consider uh, as as you're you're planning this. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, in my experience, the more complicated something is, the more parameters, the more qualifications, the more exemptions, the more time periods the less likely anything's actually going to be accomplished in the way you expect. And I wonder, I, and I, I've heard everyone's pleas about this and, and I'm trying to be very respectful of those who feel excluded right now, but I don't know if a vaccine requirement of any kind is going to allow us to gain any additional safety above what could be provided by strict adhering to masking and social distancing. Uh, this, is, this is a lot of effort for what I expect to be minimal gain. I, I am concerned though um, about, because I, as I said, I. I registered and um, I had to come back because I went to the morning to went in the morning to see how to register and they said can you come back in the afternoon I made appointment etc and so I witnessed which I thought was anecdotal um, this issue in one particular area in the senior center and it was a masking issue mm -hmm. and at both times that I witnessed it I brought it to the attention uh, to the individual who I interacted with and I was surprised to hear from others that it's sort of a known thing that this group doesn't effectively wear a mask or wear a mask. And so that, that concerns me <laughs> that if um, this is the basics, you know, this is what is required and that's not being adhered to. And so I'm, I'm just, it's making me call to question, you know, the practices. And so I just have to say that. So I can understand we may not be gaining much, but we certainly can gain a whole lot if we can ensure um, adherence to this, to this one particular thing that appears to be continuing to happen. The masking you're talking about. That's right. Yes, yes. That, that's, that, that's where I think there's a gap that could be acted upon tomorrow um, without a lot more effort. I did bring this, um, so I got the email today, Cynthia, or yesterday, thank you for forwarding that to me. And I had a conversation with Maria about that. And it was very simple. If they do not want to follow the policy, then they need to be asked to leave. She needs to be in control of her building and uh, you know, it's, it's cut and dry and it's part of your onboarding with the members as they were orienting when they come back. So I think she agreed with me at that yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did, we did um, let them know through their group liaison and in person, so. Great, thank you. Any other comments, thoughts, motion? Yes, if um, if we were to make a motion today, um, obviously the devil's in the detail, but at the same time, uh, you know, when we get credit cards advertisement in the mail, we don't get the fine prints on the first page. We get the uh, the overall message, and I think that's what we're here to do here. Uh, I am not suggesting it's not going to be complicated, but I. I think something needs to be done. And if we do a motion, is this a motion to make it mandatory? Is the motion to request that the Department of Health put something to a protocol in, in, in writing about, about a vaccination mandate? Because obviously we're not going to resolve every question of every exemption and every detail here. We can certainly have a motion on the big, uh, big items but something's going to get complicated next week when we start putting this mandate in place and there's going to be some questions so how do we resolve this can we make a motion to essentially have something prepared 
um, for review or? I understood from Meredith, they are already fully stretched with their current responsibilities. Um, I don't think there's any extra, I mean, Meredith, tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think there's um, staff waiting around to, to draw up detailed regulations for the senior center and um, a vaccine requirement. Is that true? We don't have any extra warm bodies available. We're short warm bodies just to run the vaccine clinics the way that we're running them. And we post time and time again and advertise to hire people and we cannot get the people there. So that will be a problem. So I think if um, we wanted to institute a vaccine requirement that we would need to craft the language. We don't need to craft it all tonight. I think, as Meredith said, we could craft um, some very basic language and then have another meeting um, to hash out some more details if we wanted to. All right, I'm good with that. Yeah. All right, so would anybody like to make a motion? Um, motion to uh, craft language. Uh, to uh, mandate a vaccine at the senior center uh, with um, uh, or, or a, a negative PCR test uh, without any religious or medical exemption um, with some exemption for special events. A procedural question because I had um, questions on the motion. Do we pass the motion and then keep it up for discussion, or how do we? No. So if there's an amendment, if you so that's a motion on the table. Um, I took some notes, but I didn't came write quite as fast as you spoke. A motion to craft language to mandate vaccine or negative PCR testing at the senior center without a medical or religious exemption and with some exemptions for special events. Um, and so that's the motion on the table. If someone wants to make an amendment, you can propose an amendment. We vote on the amendment um, and then we vote, uh, then there's discussion and we vote on the, the proposal with the amendment. Do I need to be seconded for even this to start? Yes, so, um, so that's a motion on the table. Is there a second? A second. Right. Um, any discussion? Um, it's the, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's the special events. I think that that's a murky topic and I'm not sure how to define it or at this point, I mean, maybe in crafting of the language we can do that, but um, I think we need to really pin that down what a special event is because it can include many different things. So I think my interpretation of this motion is that special events need further clarification, but it just does mean that there might be some events that are exempt uh, or some situations that are exempt. Um, but the motion is to craft language. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments? If there are no comments, then... Um, all in favor, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? No. Um, yes. So that passes uh, with three out of four. Um, so we would need another meeting probably relatively soon uh, to actually work on a document. And because of open meeting laws, um, we would just be working on that document um, in a public meeting. Um, so we can um, talk about a date of that meeting. Do you want to talk about that now or? What information are you looking to include in this document? What's, what's missing? What do you need? Pretty much all the exemptions. 
um, the winter market being one and the various others, so that we would need your input, the input of the senior center. And I'm happy to figure this out. In fact, I can walk to the senior center from my house, so it'd be an excellent trip. Um, so later in the meeting, we can talk about whether we want to meet earlier than our regularly scheduled meeting to craft this document. Um, does that sound, sound right? Yeah. Okay. If I could just make one more comment. I mean, sure. I, I, um, Meredith brought up a great point about the larger umbrella of seniors and the vulnerable. And I'm not sure, I'm really not sure how to address that. So I would love to continue to have that conversation because I think, you know, this, we may look at this as a low hanging fruit, <laughs> um, but I, I do think it, there's a broader conversation here. And um, I would love to entertain ideas about what we can do as a board of health in that regard, so. You thinking about for seniors in particular? Well, um, Meredith was talking about residences mm -hmm. and um, you know public spaces in residences where seniors are. Um, I I just don't know. I, I mean, we haven't mm -hmm. really talked about that. So, just for a future discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, our next topic is school committee. Uh, just sort of an update of where we are. Um, Was uh, was anybody on the call with the school committee want to give us an update of what happened? We had sent a letter to the school committee about um, recommending that even though they couldn't do a vaccine mandate for enrollment, um, just reminding them that they could do a vaccine mandate for after school activities, for example. Um, and they received that letter, I think the day before or so of their meeting. Does anyone want to be uh, able to give us an update? Sure, I will, Joanne. Okay. Um, I was at that meeting and essentially what they said was they created a policy a while back ago stating that the school committee will not be making public health policies, that it's up to the uh, advisory committee to the superintendent, which they nicknamed or gave an acronym of SHAC. Um, so they're putting that policy um, in the hands of SHAC to develop an, inf an implementation plan for student vaccine mandate for after school or extracurricular activities. Um, I sit on the SHAC committee and we agree that any mandate would have to be administra administratively feasible and not result in inappropriate sharing of confidential medical information. So the school is in the process of setting up a field in their online portal, I think it's called Aspen, so that teachers, coaches, administrators, et cetera, will be able to tell whether their students are in compliance with the policy, but not necessarily how they became into compliance with the policy. Um, whether it's exemption or what have you. Um, one, um, you know, something we're still trying to resolve or find balance is between the school's social justice mission and our, miss our mission or our goals of maximizing the number of vaccinated individuals in our community. Um, so we're still kind of talking or having conversations around that. Um, you know, in the school's perspective, it's hard to imagine to adopt a process that could potentially exclude students um, for participating in clubs such, you know, such as GSA. Um, so Can you explain what that is? Our uh, Gay Straight Alliance Club or clubs, you know, similar, um, you know, to afford greater protections of individuals that might otherwise be marginalized, I guess, is kind of the bottom line. So we really want to kind of flush out what um, the definition will be of extracurricular activities to make sure that we're not having any unintended consequence of the policy. 
Um, some members of the SHAC committee thought offering testing as an alternative to vaccination was essential for carrying out the policy in a fair way. Um, others, you know, opposed the test out option. Um, again, with the goal being maximizing student vaccination rates, being the paramount concern on how to, you know, suppress the, the pandemic. So in essence, we also had to think about timing considerations. Um, the superintendent, obviously knowing his student body the best, um, highly recommends that we don't have, we don't execute this during mid season. Um, and the earliest possible implementation date would be probably mid-March with the new sports season or tryouts for the sports seasoning uh, happening. So, and, you know, to kind of summarize the shack side of it is that, you know, we believe that we should move forward with this. We're just being very cautious and trying to think of all the different angles. So Lauren, I believe was also at the meeting, not the shack meeting, but at the school committee meeting. So he might want to add more to that end, but it was bounced to the shack committee. Yeah, I would just add that it, it's it's the timing is not ideal because um, out of all, I, I think two thirds of the school committee members are on their way out and they're going to be replaced. Um, so there's going to be a learning curve. Um, and um, although there is some continuity with this with the shack, um, there might be a little bit of delay. So I don't necessarily think that, you know, the timing is off. Um, I, I think there's a lot of it's a lot of complicated detail. Uh, now there's a new information to that meeting is that we we do see the statistics. And um, at the time of the meeting, I was not realizing we had such a high vaccination rate, you know, in the 90 percent. So now I'm wondering: is are we going essentially after if if a class is 200 people? I mean that each time, you know. Uh, we, we're talking about 30 persons. Out of 30 persons, some are going to pull a religious or a, a medical exemption. And so we left with essentially, you know, very few individuals. So are we, is this good policy to put so much effort to go after um, so few individuals? That, that's what I'm wondering. So I, I, I'm gone off the facts. Now I'm giving my opinion. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily disagree. We should, you know, I, I we should move slowly overall, but we should also wait to see how the new school committee feels because they, they may have some, you know, may, they may, may feel strong really one way or the other. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Thank you for the update. It sounds like our plan will be to wait and watch. And uh, it's really great to hear that we have great statistics for vaccination in our schools, at least in our high schools, um, and the growing numbers in our middle school and elementary schools. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Great, thank you. All right, next up. Um, I guess there's a, a question came up about what happens when we make a recommendation um, like the one that we did for recommending to businesses that employees get vaccinated. So we make a recommendation that's not a policy or a mandate. Um, what should be our way of communicating that to the public? Do we want to be more public? Do we want to make more recommendations? I mean, our, our, generally our role has been to make um, um, policies, but we can also make recommendations and, and in our role as public health um, folks um, to reiterate what CDC says or expand on that or make that more firm or make that more public or what is our role as sort of public health educators? Um, I don't know how you see our role. And if you want to do anything different than how we have been doing things that way. Uh, 
Any thoughts? I mean, I think our, our job is to make policy, but we're in this unique position of, um, of educating. And um, I think when I look at the Northampton Health Department, um, I think it's a Facebook page that comes out on a regular basis. I think that that's just one of many efforts that is so good to educate our community, um, to let people know there is a presence there and we're staying on top of it. Um, but just like you know, Fauci or anybody else, um, everyone's given their best recommendation as to how to get through a thing that we don't even know, <laughs> you know, which way to turn as as Delta comes and all these other variables are taken into consideration. So, um, I think if there was a regular, if I mean, I, I just love the Northampton Health Department updates on a week. I think it's weekly, isn't it, Meredith? That it comes on Facebook. Or, um, or oh, maybe it's, not, it's not, yeah. So it's on the city's webpage. We have a COVID page and we have a vaccination page and we have, Viv, is our other page separate? Our, our data page, is it separate from the vaccination page? We have a COVID information page that I try to keep updated pretty regularly. Um, I update it weekly with our dashboard to mm -hmm. pay data. We have a vaccination page, which has information about our clinics and also about the vaccines that's updated by our other nurse, Kate Kelly. Mm -hmm. And we take that information and we share it on social media, so. Yes, yeah, because okay. I, I, the city website is just a nightmare right. for me. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it must be for the, for the, I don't know, for others as well. But I, I just don't know if we can use the Gazette, not, I'm, Joanne, your question was for the board and so I'm not pushing this down to the health department, but how we can, how we as a board can use the Gazette or other ways to talk about a particular topic or whatever and say, this is our best estimate, particularly since COVID is here. I, I mean, I think it's a nice thing to offer to our community, but um, I don't know if there's a will, if we feel that education is part of our role as well. Um, I kind of think it is, um, you know, as an active board, but um, it takes an effort, you know, and um, I'd be happy to, you know, work on that with somebody, if somebody's interested in, in different ways that we could do it, even if we rotated an opinion piece. I think, Meredith, you did that a couple of times, you know, and Joanne, I think you, I mean, Dr. Levin, you might have done that as well. So, um, I don't know, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm for it. We tried coffee hour with the health department. That didn't go <laughs> really well. <laughs> we had one guest. <laughs> Thanks for trying. <laughs> you know, in the beginning of COVID, we had a lot of people attend, but our, at our last one, we just had a it, um, a couple people. It wasn't worth the effort we had to put in. Sure. Um, yeah. Here, but we thought we would do that on a monthly basis at the mm -hmm. senior center. We also have other social media to maybe attract our younger crowd. We, I think, can now boast 32 followers on Instagram. Well, okay. I mean, you could you can tell us what's the best you know way to reach that particular population, but um, well, I don't think we're going to stoop so low as TikTok yet. But okay, fair enough. Well, that is our population that's least vaccinated, right? Our younger adults. Um, well, hence the Instagram. <laughs> but I think, you know, I, I don't think this is a one size fits all. We really, you know, what is the information that we want to get out there will drive how we get it out there. So I think that's what we have to consider. I think we're fighting a powerful force, which is people are exhausted. Mm -hmm. They're exhausted by this topic. A lot of people don't want to hear anything more about it. Um, they, the, the, the ones I believe are responsible have been, have been vaccinated and um, aware of their masks indoors and believe they're doing their part. Um, but by and large, people have been over this for a long time. We're also up against a ton of misinformation. Um, Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's fueled by money too. There's powerful social media algorithms in place that I don't think we can compete against. I mean, right. I'd have to have a lot more spare time to power through that social media campaign. Just curious, Vivian, do you think young adults uh, subscribe to a local newspaper? 
Um, no, and I would say most people on social media are immediately deterred by paywalls online. So I think a lot of people read headlines and that's it. And then otherwise mm -hmm. get information from YouTube, um, TikTok, sponsored advertisements on Instagram and Facebook, if they're on Facebook. A lot of oh. young people are not using Facebook anymore. Mm -hmm. How large is the circulation for the Gazette? No idea. Mm -hmm. um. But to, you know, to your point, Suzanne, uh, uh, Dr. <laughs> Smith, um, <laughs> Suzanne, it, just I think it's okay. <laughs> I want to honor credentials. <laughs> no, um, I talk to um, <laughs> um, that exhaustion thing, you know, I, I still look at the headline that you're talking about, Vivian, that says, should I spend Thanksgiving with my family indoors? Okay, I still look at that. And I've seen it answered 100 different ways. And, and I'm wondering, like the one that we were talking about, if I'm if I'm a young person, um, are your reproductive rights at um, are vulnerable if you have the vaccine? You know, I mean, just those that headline stuff. And so some of us will be like, I don't, I'm not really, really worried about my reproductive rights because I'm worried about my grandchild and things. You know, if that's the grab, somehow we work off of that um, because you're, you're right, there is an overall exhaustion and. Um, I'm just wondering if we could explore it a little bit more um, to do this education piece, but maybe pine the sky, I don't know. I do hear from many, many people that they appreciate us, appreciate us being out there and being approachable because we're trusted. I hear that time and time again at our clinics, yes. from our staff, um, from our businesses. Uh, so I think it's still worth the effort again, but how do we get it out there? Mm -hmm. What's like even that curricular activity, extracurricular activity, Cambridge School of or City of Cambridge letter, you know, I never thought about that. Kids playing contact sports and what is that vulnerability? I just never thought about that because that's not my my age group, but it's something. You know, I'm glad you, you know, it was brought to our attention and we're talking about it in the schools. So, but yeah, Meredith, I, I mean, that trust factor is so high, maybe not for everyone in the community as evidence this evening, but, um, but I think we, you, you know, have built that foundation for us to continue to educate, so. The clinics reached people who didn't even know we had a health department. Um, I mean, it was a major exposure, a tremendously impressive exposure for people who had no idea what the department was, what it did, what its purpose was, and they saw it functioning at a top-notch level. And that was, that was a great publicity tour you did there, Meredith. I mean, in all, in all seriousness, pe pe people got it. Um, that's, it wasn't the purpose, mm -hmm. but, but, but people got it. Yeah. We're doing our third county tour right now. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith's bringing the band. <laughs> so I think if there's a topic that comes up that we all agree, like needs to get out there, if someone wants to, you know, craft a letter and rent it by the board and we would all sign on. I think that we should, it makes sense to do that periodically. And then mm -hmm. Viv can post it on TikTok. <laughs> um, um, I know last year, I think it was before Christmas, I wrote an article about safety and gathering and I didn't get to do that before Thanksgiving this year, um, different ways. But I mean, obviously we've all seen a zillion articles on how to be safe or you know can we be safe and get together in thanksgiving and having something like that before the christmas holiday probably would make some sense um whether we're really going to change anyone's behavior you know, was there anyone who hasn't thought about it i don't know mm -hmm. um but it does seem appropriate for us to 
say it because sometimes you just have to say it again. Um, I don't know. You know, Julian. Oh, I'm sorry, Suzanne. Go I ahead. I was going to say. I think it's going to be very important to follow the numbers after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I think that will give us a lot of information about how aggressive a push should be. I mean, if the, if the numbers start to really, uh, they're rising already, but if we mm -hmm. see a dramatic rise after Thanksgiving, that's, that's a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. I don't see how there couldn't be, yeah. but I'd be very surprised if they didn't go up after I'm that. hoping against hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm anticipating a rise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just, and uh, go ahead, last I'm Sorry, just to add, you know, I've been with um, the health department for 10 years, and this has been part of our vernacular for 10 years about the board, you know, being involved in writing pieces like this. So I feel like, you know, we want to do it. Everybody gets super busy, and I understand that. Um, but yeah. I, I just wanted to put it out there. Like we've been wanting to do this for so long. <laughs> yeah. Can I offer to come up with a communication strategy or plan to, um, to respond to that? Um, and just I was gonna it. say, this is your area of expertise. We'd love to have your input. <laughs> <laughs> well, but um, if that sounds good to folks so that we can keep this um, front and center. Mm. Sure. So our Hampshire Hope team, we um, publish a letter every other month. And for the year we have, we assign, you know, by volunteer, voluntold maybe, <laughs> who is gonna write that letter. And we actually, um, you know, we don't want to instill the fear in anyone about having to write a letter to the Gazette. So we have someone who worked for the Gazette, uh, Lori Lozell, who kind of just takes all of our thoughts, we'll do a brain dump on her, we'll co-write it together and publish. Um, it's brilliant. It takes the pain out of having to do it oneself. Um, so, I mean, maybe think about it doing that way. Start small every other month, perhaps. That's a great idea. So you have a group discussion with her and give her your thoughts about what's going on. And she writes the actual article. Mm -hmm, she does. Yeah. Wow. That's nice. Mm -hmm. It's very it's nice. Beautiful. She makes me sound brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> That's Lori who does it. Huh? It's Lori Lozell who does it. Yeah. Yeah. And she's had, yeah, she's had that history with the Hampshire Hope Connection. Yeah. So it's, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Meredith, I'm surprised because until now I was thinking Meredith is so impressive. She does <laughs> all that work. She never sleeps. And now you just give up your secret. Cats out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great, a great service. Lauren, we co-write. Oh. <laughs> Ghostwriter. The ghostwriter in the yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Great. So Cynthia, um, either next time or in January, you want to bring some kind of plan to us, yes. or yes. Uh, maybe you can talk with the Gazette and find out what if there's a um, someone available there to be our connection and go straight for us, or or what? I'd love to fatten up that paper. Every time I get it, it's so like thin. <laughs> <laughs> great. Anybody else on this topic? Anything else? Okay, great. Well, I just had a quick question. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stepping back one, but I wanted to know uh, who's on the shack, uh, yep. aside from no. you. Yep, so we're the advisory committee to the superintendent. So it's myself, it's Vivian. It is the director of health services for the school, which is Lisa Saffron. Um, there is a union representative on that committee. There is, help me Viv, um the super nurses, a couple school no, nurses there's huh? school, school, nurse, school yeah. nurses uh karen from ryan road the uh, school nurse okay. yeah i think there's two school nurses yep and the and the superintendent obviously mm -hmm. but not the mayor i presume no mm -mm. and isn't um, there a school committee member yeah school committee no mm -hmm. oh really no. interesting that was the old advisory committee yeah. Okay, let's just go on. Um, Board of Health meeting frequency. I guess the, the question was, do we want to meet if we wanted to do educational things and 
sort of be more proactive? Do we want to meet more often? Or do we want to just sort of do it depending on what's going on? Um, I just want to say bye. To, I'm, I'm just want to say bye and thank you to Vivian. She's got to hop off. Thank you so thank much. You, Vivian. Thank um, you, Viv. I sometimes think when we have these policies that we want to get going on, that there's this lag because we have to, you know, open meeting it and workshop it and you know and get it out there. Um, so. In those cases, I'm happy to, you know, meet more. I don't know if we rate if we should do it on a regular basis and then cancel if need. I I don't know, but I'm, I think sometimes it gets to be a time crunch, and we have to. I, I see the need for it anyway. Other thoughts? Well, when we've needed extra meetings, we've created extra meetings. Uh, we've done that through the pandemic. When we haven't needed them, we haven't had them. So can we do them on an ad hoc basis? So given that we um, passed a regulation to a motion to uh, craft language, do we want to meet sooner than our regularly scheduled meeting to craft that language? Um, let me just look. We're scheduled. Um, scheduled for the 16th, right? Yes. 16th. That's a ways away. Do we want to meet? So there's Thanksgiving. I'm away the week of December 6th. Do we want to meet in between there, the week of the 29th? Are you okay. saying next week? That's next week. Yeah, just to finish up this work that we started. I mean, I'm not sure why would we want to delay it um, just to get it done. I'm away the following week, and then the week after that is our regular meeting. Oh, so it should be December 2nd, for example. December 2nd or Tuesday the 30th. Um, Got it. Thoughts? And it would be at that meeting we would craft something, or prior to that meeting, one of us would draft something, and then that would be sent out as an agenda item. Either way, if you have something that you know you want to work on something privately, and that would be a basis that would just give us a head start, um, for example, in crafting language, um, that probably would be helpful rather than starting from scratch. Um, it's always good to start with something. Um, I think that would be helpful, but it would have to be a public, regular public meeting. If it were a subcommittee of two. Public. Yes. Open meeting law, yeah. What right, so I guess would we not, if we called it a subcommittee, we would not need a quorum, um, but it would still be an open meeting. Can't um, vote. What's that? You can't vote in, in a subcommittee. A subcommittee right, because then, then the, it would still have to go back to the larger group um, for approval. Um, but if everyone could make it, because we're a small group, maybe there's no reason to do it in two steps. Um, thoughts? Do we want to meet next week? On Thursday the 2nd or Tuesday the 30th? It seems like people are available. Tuesdays as well. Any dates you can't do it? Tuesday is not a good night for me. Oh, okay. I had to cancel something. Thursday the second. It's okay with me? Everybody else? Okay with me. Yeah. Cynthia? Suzanne? Yeah. It's 5 30. Yeah. Um Meredith, are your presence would be appreciated because you're you understand the senior center. I mean, I'm, there's a part of me that would like to give you a pass, but I think we really sort of need you um, for the exemptions or your thoughts about that. Um, would you be able to join us? I have a capital meeting next uh, that week, and I'm not sure what evening it is. So um, let me let me find out. I don't, you know, because I missed it because my vacation got delayed. Um, so let me find out what day that is. But yeah, uh, if it's not that day, I can make it. Mm -hmm. All right, so why don't we plan on 5.30 December 2nd? 
You um, want me to go ahead and try to talk to the senior center, the director, and see what she wants. I can go and make an appointment with her and discuss. That, that doesn't stop us from, I could do that. See if there's really some, a list of exemption that we could come up with. Mm -hmm. That's reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to make contacts, go to the senior center and meet with her. Uh, I guess the end of this week is not going to happen, but early next week to, do, to make this happen. Lauren, instead of listing the list of exemptions because they're always going to change, can't you flip the language around to just include normal um, activities in the senior center between Monday through Friday through 830 yeah. and 4.30? I think that would be so much cleaner. Yes. Well, she said mm -hmm. that there some of these activities happen during those hours. Right, but, people but they're not the using the senior center. They're coming in, they're picking up, they're taking out like... Um, no, like Joe Comerford and the PBTA, those are all outside people coming in to meet with constituents. Interfaith, they were all, these are all during regular senior center hours, I believe. So they what are. about, what about um, if you frame it members of the... <clears throat> members of the senior center coming to use the facility. I just feel like there needs to be a, a cleaner way to do this than exemptions. The no, I, 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 I agree. Yes. I agree. Yeah. We need to make something that makes obviously their life easier. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not subject to a constant something that's straightforward for future events. I, I, that, that, that makes sense. It's not going to be perfect. I mean, I, I, I think the mayor already mentioned Iron Horse. Obviously, you can go to a concert and you see people without masks and you can see probably people that flunk the rules successfully. I'm not suggesting, but it looks to me that we just want to make, make the best possible, a good faith effort to make this happen. And I would... Um... Um, Marie was talking about um, artists coming in and musicians coming in and those that's programming for the senior center I would not say that those are exclusions or exemptions and sort of things that are part of the programming for the seniors would all fall under this and they can choose and they would choose either not to come or get vaccinated if they really wanted to come or send somebody else from their organization um, that's the thing about it is that no one's mandated to go. Um, so if they're not vaccinated or don't want to get vaccinated, then they don't go. Um, they, and just a, a comment about the staffing. I'm I'm really feel um, uh, um, the ability to to carry this out. Um, every single one of our mandates and our regulations have put a strain on either a restaurant, a business, whatever, and they they had to find an ability to carry it out. And it was interesting for me to note that when I re-registered, um, what happens is you, you get your key card and you have to apply it to a, a computer screen and that just checks you in. And so I'm, I'm not saying I'm not minimizing the tasks, but if, the, if we re-registered 750 members again to, for the vaccination thing, as soon as you walk in, if that was plugged in the software, that's it. That's all that would have to be done. Um, so, and somebody monitors that. So you you just can't walk right now. You just cannot walk into the senior center without checking in. So Meredith, you had uh, or 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 Marie had said that you had told her that you can't store vaccine I don't know information. She, I don't no. know where she came up with that. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. So they can certainly keep track of someone in a yes, no column. Yes, they've complied with our rules and no, they've not complied with our rules. We don't know the, need the details of their medical history. Mm -hmm. um, right? Mm -hmm. so, okay. So that's not a barrier. Mm -hmm. They can't store the medical document. Okay. Right. But they can check, 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 check box. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Lauren, you want to take this on and then um, 
Yeah, I'll try to reach out and make an appointment. I'll I'll call tomorrow and uh, or con email contact by email and see if, see if she's willing to meet um, before the meeting. And do you want to? Um, so we have to post the meeting. If we have the meeting on a Thursday, we have to post it Monday. I'm just wondering if I document. If we're going to work on a document, does the document need to be posted? Or not necessarily. No, only to, no. That's only a regulation for Title Five. That's the only requirement where we have to take excerpts of an order and put it in the paper two weeks in a row. No other order requires that. What's Title Five? Septic. Septic. Mm -hmm. huh. um, um, so we don't have a document or or a, a draft ready, but by the time it's posted, that's okay as long as the topic is posted. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, Cynthia, just kind of to dovetail on what you were saying about the burden that it puts on the restaurants and whatever business, but also the burden that it puts on the health department. And I feel like this is going down that rabbit hole. Somehow this is going to fall on our lap. She, it shouldn't. Yeah. It shouldn't. I mean, we've all taken on burdens. I mean, the hospital, I mean, to implement masks, I mean, to implement uh, like a whole bunch of things. It, every everybody's taking on some burden to make this a safer place, right? Wherever they they are, and she's got to take it on. I think. Well, I agree, but we we heard from both the mayor and from Marie tonight that somehow the health department is going to be involved here. Mm, that that means strikes me as a little arbitrary. It's like if you put a rex on us, you you in charge of <laughs> operationalizing. Why not? Mm -hmm. She'll figure it out, I think. But Meredith, you, your concern was what it would put on your department. And I'm just wondering what, in your mind, what that is. Um, like there'll be more phone calls or people saying Joe isn't vaccinated. I'm, I'm just curious. Everything and above. So I heard, I heard training, yep. um, supervising the staff. And mm -hmm. I, well, you're, you're talking about Marie now. I'm, I was talking about but, Meredith. Yeah, no, all of the above. Like there will be tons of people calling to complain about the order. There will be, I see. Uh, you know, they're not enforcing it. Complaints coming in. It's just, I see. it's the same <laughs> for whatever, you know, whatever order we put in place. It's just a, a heavy lift all the time on the health department. You have people complaining about the mask mandate, right? All the time. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. And that is part of our, um, that, that line in there about don't talk to anyone, don't ask anyone about your mask status. That, that was our advice to put in that document. That's what Marie said. She followed the health departments. Yeah. Okay. I think that's her personal point of view. That would okay. have never come out of of my mouth. Yeah, I just want to make sure because yeah. when yeah. It, Suzanne it asked and was... she said, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we have a meeting on the Thursday after Thanksgiving. Lauren is going to talk to Marie and try to draft language. Um, and um, would then you, we'll continue our meeting on the 16th unless we feel like we're sort of done. What do you what week. are you thinking for an effective date or do you think you'll know better after you talk to Marie about logistics and how they can implement? I think it's I can't imagine it happening before January. Um yeah, I think um the meeting and a discussion next week are probably going to tell a little bit more what's mm -hmm. realistic or what isn't. Mm -hmm. She's going to have to go back to the 700 people that were just re-enrolled and get their information. No, well, that's a task. Um, so do you want to just go ahead? Just to, as I do think there are volunteers that are willing to help with that, though. I mean, I'm not minimizing the task, but um, I agree. 
I guess another question is, do they need to see a vaccine card or can someone just give them information by phone? Thoughts on that? I think if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. Have to see the card. Have to show the card. What about um, just a testing and signing on a, the dotted line? I guess the, the question for me is, would they have to come in person? Can they send a photo of their card? Um, or can they give information on the phone? So if you think, I'm just trying to avoid, you know, 700 meetings. Um, Why not we do it as simply as, um, well, I, I realize the problem is you have, <laughs> is to, to essentially do it as people show to the center and then just, but I, I, I realize that means that you need to enforce at the entrance, you need to have someone asking for a card for a long period of time. I suppose they can start that way and eventually get it in people's records and then get their cards updated, whatever that means. Cynthia, um, did you say you have to swipe in to use mm -hmm. the center? Yeah. So it's electronic. Do you have to sign anything or just swipe or what happens? It's, um, it's, it's, it's electronic, definitely. And I have to, uh, it was a two-step process. You go to the receptionist and you ask why you, she asks you why you're there. And then you just say, I'm here to use the senior center. And then she'll route you over to the computer, which is about 10 steps away. Mm -hmm. Or I'm here to see Marie, right. you know, whatever. So I can't remember if I had to sign in when I re-registered. Well, she's got a good team. They'll figure it out. I, I do think, you know, something like, okay, effective, uh, we make the policy effective whenever, and then she tells all her members. It's a good communication network there. Um, effective whatever date, you're all gonna have to prove vaccination. You can do it by coming in you can do it by sending us a photo, you know, as opposed to going one member at a time because that member that got dropped off to go to the fitness class all of a sudden finds out they've got to be vaccinated. And then we're like, that's okay, you can come in anyway. You know, I, I think it's a little loose. But... They've got the monthly newsletter. So if we give them ample amount of time, it can go in the newsletter. They can do a robocall to their members. So I just, I was thinking like time-wise, just make sure that we give the appropriate amount of time for them to implement and get notifications out. So maybe February, do you think that's enough time? Wait, I think Marie would be the best to answer that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But I do have to say having observed, I don't know what goes on when they serve meals, but having observed the bridge group, there were about 30 people totally, mask, totally not speaking to one another, you're just focused on the bridge. Um, and then it was this other area in the pool room that was just no masks. So I, I, it would be nice, you know, some, I know shaming people and self-monitoring is not a cool way to go, but if they felt that here is now a mandate, then maybe they'll feel a little more comfortable doing that. So I don't know. All right, um, Meredith, uh, department update, vaccine clinic. Um, we're moving and grooving. <laughs> we're, still we're, at, yep. we're, we're still at the Elks, um, three, four days a week, weekends. We're still at um, uh, the municipal building twice a week to do the immune compromised population and we are taking pride that we are within 1.5 miles of everybody having a site to be able to get vaccinated in the city. We're covering where their gaps are. So it is walking distance. I think 1.5 is a little arbitrary, but like the school bus is if you're under two miles, um, you have to walk. So we figured that would be a good point. Um, so the city can get a vaccine at some point within 1.5 miles of their home, which is great. Um, so Kate is really a super champion of health equity when it comes to that. Um, our regional clinics are huge success. There is 
um, way more demand than we can supply. Um, they, they want us at, you know, all the regional schools, they want us in, I think seven different communities have signed up, signed up for us to go out there. Um, we're trying to keep the, um, five to 11 separate from the 12 and up because we already have enough going on with the 12 and up because of three different types of vaccines, um, two, you know, the booster shots being a different dose, um, so we've been trying to keep them separate, but I'm finding in some of the more rural communities, and of course them knowing their populations better, they feel that they would get more people to come if we could offer the adult and the child vaccine at the same time. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, we're considering bringing the flu vaccine to the, the COVID clinics also. So we're moving and grooving, we are way busy. And then as you all heard now, everyone, is eligible to get their booster who are 18 and above um, as long as it's been six months. So this is a whole nother layer that we're going to be adding on. But um, I think we vaccinated, I don't know, over a thousand people last week. Oh. So yeah, I we are um, the only local health department in Western Mass running a, a vaccine clinic and have since last January. You took on a lot and we are glad you did. Um, you're doing amazing work. I worry that it, you know, you're, you and your staff are burning out from um, providing this service, but it's obviously awesome service. Thank you. Yes, I worry about that too. Yeah, we, uh, we're definitely busy. And the, um, <coughs> for the people who work at the clinic, and your nurses are funded how? So several different ways. Um, we were funded, so FEMA goes through December 31st. So all of our vaccine related expenses can be charged to FEMA. That's if we don't get reimbursement for vaccine administration, which we're supposed to get. It's only been trickling in. So I'm not sure if it's really gonna cover all the expenses. But whatever it doesn't, we have to put in an application for FEMA to reimburse us for. After December 31st, we're solely relying on receiving the vaccine administration fee um, to be able to support the efforts if they don't renew or extend the FEMA money, which I'm hoping they will, I'm thinking they will. The regional efforts that we're doing now, we're doing through the Public Health Excellence Grant that I just got um, for three years. I hired three um, part-time nurses and they're really champions. They're kind of taking over. One of them has been with Kate and our vaccine clinic since I think last March. And so she has been a lead nurse since then and is really being the champion on coordinating with Kate to do all of the regional efforts in Hampshire County. Um, and that's all through the Public Health Excellence Grant that we're able to continue that work. Awesome. Mm -hmm. When you say the vaccine administration fee, you're talking about insurance? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For every poke, we get a, a dollar amount. So you, you have to take everyone's insurance info? Well, we, we vax, right. So on the, um, on the registration form, it asks for it, um, but there is an opt-out, you don't have to put it. In if you don't have insurance or mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. want to, you know, in the old days when everyone was on that commute computer refreshing all the time and trying to get an appointment, they just didn't put in the vax, uh, the health insurance information. Um, so our standard for like our flu clinics is 15%. We don't get insurance information for, um, for, for I'm, so I'm thinking it'll be right around there. Not that this is a money-making business, but um, if we do get the reimbursement fee for the other 85%, um, it will, will come out a little ahead and support other future vaccine programs. Uh, we have a revolving, a, fund, a revolving fund in the health department for all of our vaccine programs that I started year one um, that the mayor granted. So that's where the money will go into and any leftover will support future efforts, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other, uh, any other updates you wanna give us before we get into our minutes? Uh, no, I, I'm on 
been on vacation, so I'm. <laughs> We're so glad. <laughs> uh huh. We're so glad you got away. Thank you. <laughs> um. All right, team. We have one more thing, which is our minutes. So I did talk to Alan Seawald about how we do our minutes and. Again, we can't really share documents. Um, and I guess we've been getting around that a little bit by going through Kelly or Meredith and it just seems cumbersome. Um, so I think maybe we should go back to the way we used to do it is bring your edits to the meeting and we'll just put it at the end of the meeting. Um, and I'll try to, <clears throat> when I do my review of the minutes, I'll try to you know, do as much editing um, of content as well as commas and colons, um, but I'm sure I uh, I missed that, missed some things. Um, but anyway, has everyone seen the minutes from October? Um, uh, I, I yep, I, go for it. I, I took a look, but I, I, I it's one day one day is a little too. Uh, okay, all right. So we're going to put these aside then. If you had haven't had a chance to look at them, and um, we I, will I, review them I, next time. Yep. I sent my comments to Kelly, so, and, and I don't know who else sent comments. Maybe she could um, put together the comments that have already been sent into one document, and that could be the document that we respond to next month instead of having to redo effort that we've already done. Okay. Cynthia? Yeah, that, that sounds Kelly. thanks, Suzanne. That sounds good. I don't know why I didn't think of that, but Kelly, since you're listening, I don't think we had in the minutes the fact that we referred the senior center discussion to this meeting on November 23rd. I didn't see that anywhere. So, um, but I'm happy to just put a note again to Kelly about that. Okay, Kelly, sorry for talking about you like you're not on the on the call. Oh, that's okay. So, do you know where that would have lived in the well we we said that's what we were going to do right and so since it was a direct action i thought it should be documented so i think it can go okay anywhere. okay unless i missed it kel no I'll, I'll add that okay that we made an active decision to visit that topic yes and put okay. it on the agenda mm -hmm. okay all right, Kelly, you and I can powwow. Okay. The minutes. So we'll put uh, put the minutes off for the moment. Any other business? Anybody else have anything they want to uh, discuss or put on our next agenda? Can I just ask Amy to hop on? Uh, she sent me a text that I think is interesting because um, Amy, can you hop? I hate to put you on the spot. I can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, so a couple times during the meeting, Marie spoke and I think also Cynthia with her um, application to the senior center talked about like that uh, question regarding um, not speaking to other mm -hmm. members, right? And so in your um, order, uh, August 11th, and then again in August on August 26th, the amendment, in the exemption, it talks about, hold on. Uh, We're talking about the masking order? Yeah, the masking order. It talks about under exemptions, right in the first paragraph, it talks about nothing in this order is intended to encourage residents to act as enfor enforcement of this order. Resi residents should not take it upon themselves da, 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 to enforce that. So maybe that's where she got it. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't come, you know, as a directive from us, but it is in our order. And I think that goes out to the public, like when they're at the ZMAR or they're in the gym, not to engage with other people and to let the businesses themselves like enforce that. So I just kind of wanted to bring that. I, I tried to unmute I earlier and I, and I, I, I wasn't able to. So um, I was <laughs> like, wow, no, I think that's in the order. No, I thank you. That's probably what she was referencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. That's yeah, helpful. You're welcome. Yeah. So I guess that's discouraging people from being vigilantes, but yeah. it doesn't, doesn't mean you can't ask somebody. 
Yeah. Um, I actually did run it by Alan Seawald and he said there was nothing illegal about that. And particularly that was a informational sheet. No one had to sign that paper, I think. Um, but he couldn't, he wouldn't comment on whether that was best practice. It's tricky. It's yeah. tricky. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? So we will meet again on the Thursday after Thanksgiving. Thank you for, uh, to Laurent for following up with the Senior Center and drafting something that we'll, um, we'll uh, work on. I think maybe we'll share a document and, and really just really work on it in writing at that time. Um, Kelly, thank you for posting that meeting next week. Um, anything Welcome. else? Uh, just a clarification, we'll share a document. Who will originate that document? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start it. Okay. Um, I can give some background stuff too if you need it. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I would be interested. That's okay for me to send it, right? If you route it through uh, Kelly. You route it through, or through Kelly. Kelly. Got it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a very uh, interesting and productive meeting. And have a wonderful holiday and see you next week. Do we have to adjourn? Yes. You oh, need to yeah. Uh, move to adjourn. Is there, do I hear a second? Any second. discussion? All in favor? Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Yes. Thank you all.